Good evening, everyone. Before we start the uh, meeting tonight, uh, if everyone remembers Warwick, Rhode Island, the exits are here, they're out there. We do not want to block the, uh, the entrance out. There are five seats available up front here. If everybody could make sure they've pushed in so there's other seats available so people could sit down. Uh, if you have a chair you want to set up, it has to go either on the wall. We could even create another, another row of chairs up front here, but please uh, don't block the, uh, the entrance and the exit ways there. We want to be absolutely safe on that issue. Um, <laughs> Getting it out of the thank way. You, so thank you very much. You. And welcome to the, uh, the regular scheduled council meeting for uh, Wednesday, March 12th. Tw uh, and I would ask the town clerk, uh, up the, we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance first. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If we could have the roll, clerk, uh, roll call by the town clerk, please. Chairman Roberts. Present. Councilor Berry. Here. Councilor Carson. Here. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor Lynch. Mm -hmm. Here. Councilor McGinty. Here. Councilor Swift Kayata. Here. Representative Gill. Representative Weaver. Here. Town Manager McGovern. Here. And Town Clerk Lane. Present. Thank you very much. This evening we really have a, a special uh, treat in front of us uh, as far as a presentation is concerned. I uh, had uh, one of our residents sent me a, a copy of the Cape Courier from February 1 on the J Jazz Festival and it was an extremely interesting article. If people haven't read it, you really ought to go back. Uh, this group of uh, young musicians had quite a, a task and some trials and tribulations and came through with flying colors and at this time I'd like to offer them uh, a, uh, an acclamation uh, by the town council. So I'm going to go down to the podium. Jonathan, has the uh, your teacher been, did he make it? No. no. All right. Can you, why don't we have the, uh, the jazz group come on up here so everybody can see who's with us. Yeah. Well, Adam did make it. Good. Yeah. Now this is just a small part of the group, I take it, too, right? Or is this just about everybody? It went. This is about the, the whole contingent? Great. All right, so, so on behalf of the town, the town of Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth Town Council Proclamation. Whereas the Cape Elizabeth Concert Jazz Ensemble recently was recognized with top honors at the 35th Annual High School Jazz Festival at the Berkeley School of Music, and whereas the Berkeley Festival was the largest of its kind in the United States and the ensemble was judged against teams from throughout the eastern United States and from far away as Ecuador, and whereas this was the fifth consecutive year that the ensemble has been recognized as the most artistic and talented performers at the Berkeley Jazz Festival, and whereas the ensemble's selection this year followed a stressful day within which the team was temporarily erroneously disqualified due to a judging error on the length of the performance. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council that we hereby congratulate the Cape Elizabeth Concert Jazz Ensemble, their first year director, Tom Lazat, and the students' parents on the distinguished performance of the ensemble, and especially for their strong and poised recovery from what were once thought to be near and insurmountable odds, and we thank them for representing our community so well and for being such an inspiration to younger aspiring musicians in Cape Elizabeth. again very much.
if you folks, you know, if you don't have to hang around, if you want to, you're more than welcome, but if you'd like to leave. <laughs> <laughs> The next item on our agenda is the uh, reports and correspondence. Uh, do any of my fellow councillors have any reports you'd like to offer this evening? Uh, Councillor Barry. I attended the meeting of the Executive Council of the Council of Governments, and um, the uh, county is uh, being made a member of the Council of Governments, and we had a short presentation on range roads, principally of which are in Standish, Maine. But uh, then the next meeting is next month. You know, that's about all that happened at that meeting. Thank you very much. I represent the Kate. Anyone else have anything? Councilor Carson. I would just like to say uh, uh, publicly that um, I am sorry if you did not all get a personal response back to a variety of emails that we've had on several issues, not just this and not just the fort, but there have been several issues. Clearly, it is almost impossible to keep up to answer each and every one of them personally, but I want to thank you very much for those that did send them. We have all received all of them, no matter how you get them to the town hall, we have a copy to all of them, and we have our own, each of us has a method of filing them as to which of the issues is, but I would like to have responded to all of you, but I simply, it takes me at least two and a half hours every morning I go to work to just to, to, get, to read those emails, but I do appreciate your sending them. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to offer? I had a few items I wanted to share with the council and the rest of the folks as well, I guess. This past month I was fortunate and able to represent the town at the Chamber of Commerce dinner for the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Chamber. Had Jacques Martin from Edmonston speaking to us and uh, he had, was, had discussed the uh, success they had in actually combining four towns to uh, an, an amalgamation process, they called it, to share expenses and costs. And he said that he had been adamantly against doing such a thing, and he had, but he's been overseeing it for the last five years and is absolutely convinced that they have gone the right way. And it's one of those issues that we and other communities are really going to need to look at here as well and combining and seeing how we can deliver services better, cheaper, both on the school side and the municipal side. Also was able to represent the town at the one main uh, event they had at the, over in Portland uh, where the $53,000 was generated from contributions to help out the community of, uh, communities around Millinocket with Great Northern shutting down. And I know two or three councillors were given a, uh, a tour of the school by Marie and Tom and I want to thank them publicly for taking the time to do that for us. And I was also able to take in a triad meeting with Officer Paul Ga um, uh, Gaspar and very uh, well-run, interesting uh, group for, for seniors to, who are dealing with a lot of issues in the community. And so that, I'm not sure if that was one of our boards and commissions that we had on our goal, but I took it in anyway, so, and it was very interesting. So I'll, with that, turn to the town manager. I'll, I'll defer my report this month due to uh, the business before the council. All right. And town clerk? Uh, just a quick reminder that nomination papers for town council and school board are now available. There are three positions, each available on council and school board. Uh, as of right now, we um, have several folks that have taken out papers for town council and just two for school board. And again, there are three seats available on each. The nomination papers are due in my office no later than Monday, March 24th by the close of business and would be happy to answer any questions if folks want to call tomorrow, email or what have you on that process. So we'll be happy to walk you through that. So we encourage anyone interested uh, to look further into it. Thank you. And Rihanna or Alex, do either of you have a report? Okay, just a little bit about what's going on at the high school right now. Um, winter and winter sports are coming to a close. Uh, it was a great season for all athletic teams, and we're all particularly excited about our su success um, with our champion <coughs> hockey team this past weekend. Um, at this point, athletes are gearing up for uh, spring seasons, track, lacrosse, and um, tennis also are all starting within the next few weeks. Um, mock trial, speech, and debate have closed out their seasons pretty much. We have mock trial going to New Orleans for, uh, for national competition, as well as some speakers and debaters uh, who are also going to nationals. Um, Cape Jazz Ensembles and bands, as you just saw, made an excellent showing at Berkeley. 
And uh, we have a student named Whitney Durkanis at the high school who is being recognized by Channel 6 as one of Maine's teens who care. Um, that about closes what we're doing. Oh, also, MEA testing just ended at the high school, and juniors will be happy to tell you that. Uh, preparations are being made for the future as underclassmen choose their courses for next year and as seniors work on their senior transition projects. So that's kind of the buzz of the high school right now. Thank you. Rian, and could you turn the podium yeah. this way as well, too, so when people do get up to speak, they'll be addressing the council. There we go. Thank you. <clears throat> During each council meeting, we have two opportunities for the, for the general public to get up and speak to items that are not on the agenda. Uh, this evening, obviously, we have the Pond Cove item. Tomorrow night, we have Fort Williams. So. Hopefully those would not be items unless you cannot make one or the other. But if there's anyone in the audience that would like to get up to uh, speak to the council on, on other items, uh, now is the time to do so. So just you can raise your hand or go to the podium. And All right, well, seeing none, then we can, can move on. The minutes of the, uh, uh, the meeting for held February 10. Do I have a motion to accept those? So moved. I so moved. Second. second. All right. Any any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? That was easy. The uh, <laughs> I guess before we get to the, the the other items, I would ask people to, if you have a cell phone, if you could put it on the vibrator, turn it off, so it's not distracting everybody while we're listening to somebody else. It really would be appreciated. <laughs> Item number 920203, public <laughs> hearing. <laughs> A lot of cell phones out there. Huh? Wow. <laughs> public hearing report from school board school facilities. After the public hearing, the town council will discuss the issue and may or may not make a definitive decision at this time. Uh, I had some additional information I'd like to share with you, but this agenda item is before us this evening as we had originally believed action would have to be taken this evening to ensure that there would be time to get the question out to referendum in May if that was the desire of the council. The school department has now expressed a desire to have the question put up on the fall referendum if the council likes to go that route. This gives the council an opportunity to review material presented tonight and my understanding is that several councillors have indicated a desire to do that and not necessarily take a vote this evening. There are a number of possible options before us, and I will list them in no particular order of preference. Vote to fund the proposal, send to the voters, utilize portables or other available space, or ask the school department to make do with the space that they have. This is not necessarily all-inclusive. There may be other options. I'm going to ask the school board chairperson or the superintendent or both to give us a brief update of what is being proposed. I will then ask any counselors or give any counselors an opportunity to ask any questions they may have or if they have any comments that they would like to share with the public. We will then open up the public hearing for citizens to speak to this issue. In the interest of time, we will give people a chance to stand up if they are here in support of the kindergarten wing and are more comfortable in letting us know that way rather than everyone having to go to the podium. This will give you an opportunity to do it another way as well. This would not preclude speaking. Uh, anyone that wants to speak will be given that opportunity. And due to the number of people present, please, if you would, limit your comments to three minutes or less. We would appreciate it. And please be respectful of each speaker and refrain from either applause or forms of disagreement. So, does Marie or Tom or Elaine, anyone have something they'd like to, a presentation for us? Good. And, and Tom, if you could identify yourself. Would it be Tom Porcella, uh, superintendent of schools. Um, what we would like to do, at least on uh, the school side, is since our last meeting, um, we do have information. I know there was a, a proposal to look into some other options as far as space needed for the school. So what we would like to do um, is share that information. Um, I have information about the proposal that, was, that we considered regarding space uh, at the Hamlin School versus portable classrooms uh, in versus the new addition. Um, I did e Pauline emailed to the council. I don't know if everyone received it. But just so I think it's important that the council um, have all the data, all of the information um, prior to making any kind of decision about uh, a referendum 
or what they uh, what they would choose to do as far as this project. Thank you, Mr. The cost for um, portable classrooms, which we will need um, for uh, not necessarily the kindergarten, but we will need at Pond Cove, not next year, but the, in, during the 2004-2005 uh, school year uh, at Pond Cove School. That is the year that uh, another large class enters the high school, and we will need um, that enrollment at the high school will be up to approximately 600 students. We will need the kindergarten space for the high school. So the plan is, um, at this point, and probably the most economical plan would be to install portables uh, at, at Pond Cove School. The cost of portables for the first year, because of the installation cost, would be uh, $85,000. Uh, and each year after that, um, the lease runs uh, approximately $40,000, $35,000 for the lease, and there's some, some costs that are, that are part of that. Um, we looked into and spoke to uh, the superintendent in South Portland, um, Paulina Portria, our business manager, also spoke to uh, the business manager in South Portland to get an idea, because they were vacating the Hamlin School, if that would be an option. Um, the cost of that, the lease cost that they would charge us based on uh, the state rate of $8 a square foot uh, that they chose to give us, which would include all the operational costs, would be $86,000 for the lease. Uh, and then to include telephone lines, moves it up to $87,000. And then the inherent staff needs, the cost for the first year at the Hamlin School would be $160,000. The cost in the first year of the new addition would be um, including uh, the heat, including um, all those other costs would be $138,000. Um, so as you can see from the, from the chart, obviously as you go over the years, through the years, um, the least expensive option um, would be portables, and a lot of that depends on how long and whether we purchase those, those portables, if that's going to be a permanent solution. Obviously, the school board feels the solution would be uh, a new addition. It just seems, um, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to us to put a lot of money into portable classrooms um, when, as, we, as Marie will share with you, um, the, the enrollment figures that, that we do need, have a need for, for this addition and um, that would be something that would enhance the value of the building and would be something that would be there for a long, long time. So just as a backdrop, I share these, these cost comparisons um, and would be happy to answer any questions you might have about them. Councilor swift -Giata. I have a couple of questions. I just want to confirm um, my understanding of the numbers so, and, and of what you said. So you said that um, the kindergarten will be in high school during fiscal year 04 next year under not, any scenario. No not next year, the following year, right? Yes, the year that's 2003-2004. Oh, 2004-2005. The kindergarten will be, uh, what I said, Okay, was ahead. that the kindergarten will be in the high school for oh, one for next more year. year. Right. Yes. yes, for one more year, for next year, right. which is the 2003-2004 right. mm -hmm. school year, which is fiscal year 04. Okay. Yep. So even if this did go to referendum and the referendum passed, um, we'll have portables for one year that next coming um, year, fiscal year 05, while the building was being built. During the construction, yes. Okay. So wouldn't... You need to, um, I, I had talked to Paulina Portria about this this afternoon um, after I got these numbers. Wouldn't then, it, in effect, for the first year, you have to add in $97,300 to that first year cost because you'd need to add portables to the that portables, cost? portables, right. Too. The other thing that, and that, and that, would, that would be an added cost for that first year because we would have to house uh, the students somewhere. Yes. Um, the other piece would be, though, we could um, look at um, what we do as far as the, the debt service and whether we pay 
that kind of a payment of right. zero. We just but in, the interest. But in terms of the the whole project, that would add ninety seven. The debt service payment project. could go down, but the portable cost would still be there in that first. Okay, year. Um, and then so assuming that um, even if it passes, you'll, we'll have portables for one year. Who or what uh, classes would you recommend putting in portables? You said you thought they, they would be, be the portable. kindergartners. The kindergartners would go into the main building. Um, where we are looking at locating the portables would be um, up toward the, the library end of the building, um, and they would protrude out into the courtyard, and it would be that's kind of the third, fourth grade area. So it would be either third or fourth grade. It wouldn't be the primary place. Okay. Um, I know, I know you and I had discussed some of these already, so I feel like mm -hmm. this is sort of a funny question and answer, but just for the sake of everybody who's here, um, given that we have 31 full-size classrooms in Pond Cove and only 28 of them have classes, regular classes in them now, three are taken up by art, by music, and I think health and science, you said. Um, have you given uh, consideration to the thought of perhaps putting those special classes, classes that um, kids only visit, you know, once or twice a week on rotations for a period at a time, putting them in the portables so that all the regular classrooms, K through four, could have their own regular classroom? That's, I mean, that, that is a possibility, but what happens in other districts that have, that, that have portable classrooms, that becomes a constant traffic in and out. And especially in inclement weather, it becomes a difficult situation. If you have a music class that changes every single period, you have basically hundreds of kids that are traipsing in and out of the building rather than a self-contained classroom. I, I, thought, I thought from our previous conversation on Monday that you said the, build, the uh, portables would be directly connected to the building so children wouldn't have to go outside. Well, we would have a walkway, but actually after our, when we did take the tour um, and looking at that space, it would be impossible to connect both of them because you'd have two buildings with four classrooms directly to the building. So there would have to be some sort of a walkway. Mm -hmm. And they do have covered walkways that we could use, but it wouldn't be a situation where you could access all, both buildings without going outside. Okay. Okay. And um, I know my daughter was in a portable in third grade when the previous renovation um, was, was taking place. And um, could, you, could you just tell us uh, sort of how you compare the quality of portables, what your professional opinion is on portables now versus portables then versus whatever. In portable space is not, it, it, it serves a purpose. It's a box classroom. Um, it's clean. It's good space. It's carpeted. It has windows. Um, you know, we are looking to make sure we ventilate because that has been a, a problem in the past because in the winter you shut windows, you don't get the, the air circulation to in the rest of the building. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not bad learning space. Um, there, most of them that are, are, are good size, and it would, serve, it would serve our purpose on a temporary basis. OK. And my last question is I just wanted to make sure the three options that are listed on um, the cost comparison here are Hamlin School, um, which would mean busing kindergarten, I presume, over to Hamlin School, which is on the sort of almost on the border with Cape Elizabeth. Um, that option would total up um, according, if you rented for 20 years, which I personally think is unlikely, but if you, I don't think we want to do it then, that would be $4.3 million according to your figures. That Hamlin, if you rented only through fiscal year 07, would be $495,000. And then the next option would be portable classrooms at Pond Cove. Um, Portables, assuming you would need them past <coughs> fiscal year 07, according to your sheet, that would be $563, $63,000, sorry. Um, portables through fiscal year 07, based on the enrollment figures we had as of this morning, and I understand you may have some different ones to tell us about, that would be $194,000. And then a new addition, including debt service, operations staff, and portables would be $2.856 million. So th those are the things we're considering. Yes. Okay. The other cost with the, the other kinds of things, and I, the numbers speak for themselves, and, and, I, and I do think, and I appreciate and I want to thank Jack for looking into that. That school did 
did open up, and it was something that was intriguing to look at. Other kinds of costs associated, though, is we would have to transport kids back for occupational therapy services, and um, we would have to trans our special ed staff would have to trans to, to drive out there. So there are a lot of other issues with that, um, but I think it was something worth worth looking into. So assuming it, it sounds as though assuming if if your uh, choice is to keep if your ch recommendation would be to keep the children at co-located at Pond Cove, the choices would be between be between portables, which would be anywhere from about 195 to 500 thousand dollars, depending upon how long you needed them, or a new addition for 2.8 million. Right. Our, okay. and, Thank and you. Our figures will, will. We feel that if we're going to be in portables forever, that the idea would be to purchase them for about. It would cost us about 500 thousand dollars. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure we had all the facts and figures in common <laughs> so that we could talk about them. Thank you. Does anyone, C C Councilor Fritz? I'm just wondering about what the Hamlin School um, includes. I mean, as I understand from the newspaper, it's seven classrooms. Seven classrooms, a gymnasium, office area. Yeah. And so this lease cost is leasing the entire building. All right. seven classrooms. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't yeah. use that, but that would be the cost. That that would be the charge they would they would give to us. Is is there any was there any discussion with South Portland that they would share the school? I mean, they're moving some students out, yeah, but I don't know. Their desire is to to vacate the school mainly because it's not cost effective to stay in it. Um, and and I think that's happening throughout the state. They're closing down small schools like that. But I guess I'm wondering whether there would share it. It wouldn't be if yeah. we took three to four classrooms that would leave maybe three classrooms. They had, had been using one for, for special needs. Um, they could maybe use three of the classrooms and, and it just didn't seem like something that would be cost effective for them either when they can take those kids and put them in their other elementary schools. It just was a better financially it was better for them to do that. Mm -hmm. I guess I had an opportunity to speak with the city manager today, and he had indicated that there might be a possibility also of using some municipal uh, uses in that building to share it if it was something that you wanted to pursue. It would only guarantee city, us one year. City manager, city manager of South Portland. Um, I know they have their engineering department off campus, and uh, so it, it may be something that's still worth, you know, tweaking, looking at, and mm -hmm. not totally writing it off. It may, the, the figures could possibly come down considerably if if they wanted to do something like that. And again, unless it was, I mean, it, it's still, you have to remember, our, our goal is to bring the kindergartners back to Pond Cove. Okay. Uh, Councilor Carson. I just wanted to ask Tom, um, of all the things that the school board is working on right now, is the kindergarten your highest priority? I mean, there are so many priorities that we're all dealing with. Uh, is that the highest one now, is to focus on that? Well, obviously, this, there... this building, uh, the work of the Building Advisory Committee had, had two parts. Um, this is the least expensive of the two parks. The, the renovations right. to the high school obviously is a very high priority because that building is only going to deteriorate uh, more over the next several years. Um, but that brings with it a $7.5 million price tag. Um, but that, that isn't something to, that we can just put aside for, for very long. Uh, roofs are going to begin to have more problems and a lot of the infrastructure is going to have significant problems. But again, um, you know, between those two projects, this is the one that, that at this point, with the economic climate that we have, we felt that was uh, more viable to bring forward. Can I, okay. can I follow up on, on that? Because I had some concern, some of the emails that I received over the weekend and in the past couple of days indicated a perception on the part of some people that um, the kindergarten was a higher priority and that we should vote to approve the kindergarten and then leave the high school for several years. And so I, I want to press a little more on that question because being on the building committee, I did not understand one to be that much less of a priority. No, and in no, fact, that's true. Um, it was my sense that we were moving the kindergarten largely because we needed the space in the high school First, because we need the space. The seventh grade class is big. And second, we need to renovate the high school, so we need to get them out. And then thirdly, 
um, and, and importantly to many people, is getting the kindergarten back up with the rest of the school. So would it still be your recommendation to go forward with the kindergarten as a wing if your view was that it might jeopardize the high school for some number that's, of years. That's, and that's, I don't know if it's... And I, maybe I'm putting you on the spot. No, it is. These I, are I, the I, comments that we've been getting this weekend from folks. So. No, and I, and I can understand that, and I think both priorities, I wouldn't put, I think they're on a, on a level playing field, um, but one is, is, you know, comes with a much lower price tag. Part of our, our, our the school board's original recommendation was to move forward this spring with the kindergarten, um, and that would have avoided the use of portables altogether. Um, but at this point in time, it becomes very difficult as we get later into the into the season to go to a referendum um, this spring. If if we were able to uh, move forward this spring, we would avoid the cost of portables altogether, thus freeing up space at the high school. That was the original proposal. Um, you know, there are a lot of options, uh, such as South Portland has recently undertaken with their building project. Um, they put a, a, a vote to out on referendum that staggered projects that, and Jack might know just as more about this than I do, um, and they, that, so the cost then would be incurred over time, uh, and that might be a way to go, is to look at both of the projects one beginning at a certain time and one being delayed, but let the voters de let the voters decide um, which which is the higher priority and when they should happen, and, and that's a question that the council and working with the school board can can grapple with. But I wouldn't want to say one is more important the, than the other. I do know that if we continue to ignore the high school, um, then a a project that is $7.5 million now in three years could, would, my guess, would easily be 9 or $10 million. Um, and as I look at area schools of the same age, Yarmouth High School, which is about three or four years older than our high school, um, they're spending $15 million to renovate that building, of which three is a new auditorium, and the rest is all in renovations. Um, and when buildings get to be 35, 40, 45 years old, things start to deteriorate. Thank you. Any further questions of Dr. Fusella? Right. Did, uh, Marie, did you have something also? All right. Thank you, Tom. Prager, uh, chairman of the school board and um, the building committee. And Marie, can you pull the mic down just a little bit? Oh. Thank you. <laughs> so we have those guys to go ahead. Tonight, I'll be talking primarily about the enrollment projections. Since the last time I spoke at a town council meeting um, in February, there seemed to be many concerns and questions about our enrollment numbers. The projections we have been using were done by planning decisions of South Portland in December of 2000 during the initial facility study. We have since had two years of actual increased enrollments, which means that we have surpassed what planning decisions had called the best fit and the high fit model projections. We have since requested an updated enrollment projection and received the report yesterday. I apologize that the town council has not had a chance to review the information I just passed down. I realize it's difficult to discuss numbers when you have not had a chance to review them. I will do my best to show you visually what the numbers on the sheets in front of you are saying. And everything that I will talk about um, is written in this packet that I passed out. Planning Decisions has again given us an updated best fit model and a high model. They are both, both sheets are in your packets on pages three and four. 
I have combined these new projections to give you a range of what our, what our enrollments will potentially look like through 2010 and 2011. If you look at page two, you will be able to follow along while I explain the um, floor plans for Pine Cove. I have listed on that sheet each grade level with the number of students and classroom space that will be, used, that will be needed um, for each year. The number of classrooms is derived from our school board guidelines for class size, which states that we will have 16 to 18 students for kindergarten, 18 to 20 for first and second grade, and 20 to 22 for the third and fourth grade. Um, so if I, if are all of you able to see this floor plan? If you just pay attention to the colors and I will explain what they are. This is the um, first floor right here of Pond Cove. This is the second level of Pond Cove. Every space that is colored in are all classroom spaces, okay? So the white space that you might see are um, guidance counselor's office, uh, reading recovery office, social worker's office, uh, speech and language, conference rooms, and so on. But the, the blocks that are colored in are classroom space that I'll concentrate on. This year, or in this floor plan, we have 31 classrooms at Pine Cove. Today, we're using 27 of those classrooms for grades one through four. Four of the classrooms, um, which are in green, are for occupational therapy, music, health and science, and art. Today, we are short one classroom that we need for special education. We continually have a rise in special education students coming in um, from kindergarten that we need um, an additional classroom for them. We don't have it right now. Um, if I move on to 2004, 2005, which we are talking about the year that we need a building addition or someone in the elementary school, third or fourth graders, as Tom said, needs to go into portables. This chart shows you all of the available space that we have. In 2004, on your chart, we will need 27 classrooms that are grades one through four, okay? All of the blue encompasses those 27 classrooms. That's for first grade through fourth grade. We need five classrooms for music, art, health and science, occupational therapy, and the special education classroom that I'm talking about. We also need three kindergarten classrooms. So if you look down here, the green which is the special education classroom, and the orange are the three uh, kindergarten classrooms which we do not have space for in this floor plan. Are there any questions on that so far? Okay, then I will move to, I, I picked three years off of that chart which were all a couple years apart. The last one I will go through is 2010-2011 school year. Okay, so in 2007-2008, we will need a range and of 26 to 28 classrooms for grade levels one through four. Now, 26 is at the low end of those projections, 28 is at the high end of those projections. So what I've done is I've colored in, in solid blue, 26 classrooms, the other two that have stripes get us up to 28. Okay, so we potentially may need those classrooms based on these enrollment projections. We still need our five classrooms 
for music, art, health and science, occupational therapy, and we're still looking for that special education classroom. We don't have. I mean, now, you know, obviously some of these rooms could be switched around, but we don't have much to play with here. We still need three kindergarten classrooms, which there is no room here to put three kindergarten classrooms. So at the bottom line is we have four, these four solid classrooms right here, which are special education and three kindergarten classrooms cannot fit into this floor plan. If we only have 26 classrooms from first to the fourth grade, one of them can fit, okay, but we're still minus three. If the enrollment projections are close or are accurate, we will need both of these classrooms for first to the fourth grade. So my point is that by 2007, 2008, we will still not have enough space in our floor plan to house the kindergarten or other programming needs. Then we can move on to 2010-2011. I've done the same thing, and, and I've just kept it consistent so that the colors were consistent. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, the kindergarten could be in here, but that's not going to solve um, the space problem. Okay, so for 2010, we need 24 to 28 classrooms for grades 1 through 4, according to those projections that are on your sheet. We still need five classrooms for music, art, health and science, occupational therapy, and special education. So that guy is down here. Now, we could potentially need, with those enrollment figures, three to four kindergarten classrooms. So I've listed three as complete. I've striped the other kindergarten classroom as I've done with the blue because these are at the other end of the projection as well as the kindergarten is. That it could be three, could be four. Um, so again here in 2010, um, everything can't fit into this floor plan. Now, the, the new projections that came out from planning decisions do go to uh, 2011 and 2012. The numbers are very, if you work them out, the numbers are very similar to this, so I didn't carry it that far um, in my plan. Based on the planning decisions projections, we will not have enough space to move the kindergarten back to the Pine Cove building, nor is there enough space to consider any movement in the middle school? Um, the second sheet in your packet, which I numbered um, 1A, I think, will show you um, the range of students separated by each school and then a total K through 12. So if, if you quickly glance down, in Pine Cove today, we have 634 students, K through 4. In 2010, potentially, we would have a range from 580 to 655. In the middle school, we have 601 students today. In 2010, we could potentially have a range between 551 and 610. In the high school, four, 544 students today. In 2010, 561 to 566. So as you can see, in each of our three schools, um, our enrollment looks as though it's remaining kind of stable. Um, total K through 12, today we have 1,779 students. Um, in 2010, our range would be 1693 to 1832. I have, I've put together this floor plan for Pond Cove um, to show 
how, you know, Tom Eismeyer and Nancy Hutton go through and, and figure out the space that they need and project for the next few years. Bob Howe, the um, architect from HKTA, and myself met with both of them to get this information and divide it up into a uh, number of students per class. The building committee and the school board have dedicated the past three years of their time to focus on a long-range plan for our school district in terms of facilities and programming needs. The recommendation for an addition is a sound one for the future, and we need a resolution. If the new addition to Pond Cove is not built, we will not be taking care of our space problems in the long term. This is not an issue that will resolve itself in the next 10 years. Portables will become a reality indefinitely. The school board and the building committee recommendation rests in your hands, and we are hoping tonight to gain your support for this project. Questions? Marie, thank you. Any questions, um, Councilor Lynch? Yeah, perhaps more in the way of a comment at this point, because it is a lot of information, um, and I appreciate that you've gone back and looked again at the numbers, because I know that this is very difficult. We're, you, in particular, are trying to plan for children that aren't even born yet. So um, I, I would just note, though, that the high end um, it appears to be based on a model of single family homes, adding 35 single family homes a year. And it's an area I'd want to pursue more with the school board, because the last information I recall getting from our town manager was that over the last decade, we had added on average, including Cross Hill, 26 homes a year. I think it was 262 houses over the last 10 years. So I think that's an area where um, perhaps the town manager and the school department in the next few weeks, we can work yes. on that to make sure we're comfortable with um, either planning decisions, assumption of 36, and our planning department too, um, 36, 35 houses versus what historically has been rather low growth. So hopefully we can, with the planning, our planning department and the school board work on that so we can at least get some agreement yes. on the numbers. The, um, uh, you are correct in, in that. I have a packet um, with all of the information and how the numbers were derived from planning decisions that I can get to each of you. Um, and, and it is the same as, you know, ha the process that they did before. Um, when you mentioned 35 new housing starts, one of the things that they did in this projection was they got information from Town Hall. Last year, we had 40 new homes. They took an average of the past three years and came to that recommendation of 35 homes. So yes, that is at the high end of this model. Um, and all of that information of where the numbers came from and the birth rates and the in-migration, that will all be in the report. And I can give a change. In, in particular, I'm hoping that Maureen O'Meara, our town planner, can take a look at that perhaps. And, uh, and also, you know, if we're going to be relying on any projections, I think it's important to meet with planning decisions. I know having served on the enrollment subcommittee last time, two years later, have it, it was very difficult to figure out what some of their assumptions were. Have you met with them yet, or did you just get the report? I picked up the report yesterday. But you haven't actually met with them yet? Um, I because. had conversations with them okay. while she was doing it. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, okay, I just All right. forgot. The based on... The housing starts for the average of 10 years. Um, for 26 okay. houses. That is based on what we had looked at. Before. That's what's called the best fit model. That's the best fit model. So now, and as you recall, the first projections they did for us in the first two years, we far exceeded the best fit model and we were into the high model. So that's why she went back through and looked at both of those. 
both of those models again and i took the liberty of putting them together and giving you a range so that you could see what the low is and what the high could potentially be i just remembered my other um they also made a point of saying that um since they first did the projections for us several years ago they now uh recommend to each school that they do business with that those numbers can fluctuate up 10% or down 10% and that is what the state approves as the guidelines for school planning <laughs> kind of sounds like a kind of sounds like a weather report yeah. that's all right <laughs> and we had to pay for that huh <laughs> Yeah, Marie, thank you. And I think I'm going to ask the council there, maybe ask other questions or, or whatever. Just, just curious about one thing. Um, when you look at the land, if they base the, that figure that uh, Council Lynch asked about, I had also had it circled on my paper. They based that in the last two or three years when the largest development that we've had in many, many years, which is Cross Hill, is going online and houses being built. You talk about 35 lots a year, I mean 35 houses a year. I can't even think of 35 lots that are available in this one year, much less 35 lots every single year. We don't have any, we just don't have that much land. And I can see that by using that one figure, 35 single houses additional each year, if you put two kids and only half of them, of course that will impact your enrollment figure. But it's, it's hard for me to believe, and maybe our planner will be able to help. I cannot, I mean, you'd be building on Crescent Beach. <laughs> you know, I just can't even see where those lots are available, and yet it impacts the enrollment figure, which impacts the decision big time. Four million. Four million. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. and, and again, you know, she based her information, I mean, for the past, I think it was 10 years, we were at 30 homes right. um, that, that we were adding um, each year. And, and the past three years, there has been more growth than that. Um, but again, then, I'll point you to the best fit model, which is still much higher than what we were looking at um, from the first planning study. I think probably it would be important for us then to ask that planning group uh, where they're going to build these houses. How can they put that figure in since we're dealing with a figure for the next 10 years, 35 houses for the next 10 years, which is an enormous impact on all town services. Okay. So, just, so, so uh, then, again, if you just think of the charts that I did at Pond Cove, right. the areas where I had stripes, okay, so my, the best fit model are the solids. Right. The, the stripes are what we have the potential to increase. So even with all of the solids and the stripes in there, it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. So I'd ask the town manager, he had a comment, and then just, I do want to get to a public hearing. Yeah, so right. Yeah. Quickly. The council can discuss. Yeah. Or... I think the enrollment numbers are important that we did get some new projections. And if Maureen O'Meara was he, if she were present this evening, you know, we have seen before the planning board a, a real quiet period for the last year. Uh, the, the, as Mrs. Carson mentioned, Cross Hill came in, there was a lot of construction. I've had discussions with Steve Parkhurst, that's ha being halted partly by his decisions. And the real estate sales have slowed down tremendously in town. Uh, we do have one subdivision currently of any size, Leighton Farms are proposed before the town, but you know, every indication we're seeing is that we're in for a slow two to three years. And you know, I'd like to you know, spend some time looking at these numbers with Maureen mm -hmm. to see. So you know, I, I think for anyone who wants to comment, you know, the best fit's probably appropriate, and this is new information that needs to be looked at, but I think it's important that no one jumped to any conclusions mm -hmm. based on this study, because I'm not convinced that they did the due diligence before the planning board in what, to find out really what's in the pipeline at this point, because these numbers I'd be shocked if they carried out because it just isn't the land uh, being proposed for development at this point. Okay. Then I again urge you to look at the best fit numbers because with those numbers we have this. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. We will open the uh, session up now to uh, the general public to speak. I would ask that if you would please uh, come to the lineup at the podium so we're not waiting for people to come to come to speak. Give us your name and your address. Try and keep your comments as brief as possible, and if it's been said a number of times before, then fine. And I would also ask, if there are people in the audience that weren't planning on speaking but did want to have the council know what you're here for, please raise your hand if you were in favor of the Pond Cove edition. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. Elaine. Good evening. Um, my name is Elaine Maloney. Um, I live at 19 Stonegate Road. I'm a member of the school board and I was a uh, member of both the facilities committee and the building advisory committee. I want to thank you for allowing the public to share their thoughts tonight. Um, I would also like to especially thank Marie and Tom for all the additional work they've done um, on these building projects and uh, their work is, is, is very stellar. Um, I would also like to thank at this time all the members of the building advisory committee and the facilities committee. They were a very uh, thorough and dedicated group and uh, their reports came to me and I supported them fully when they came to the school board. Although this evening's workshop is on the proposed addition to Pond Cove, we feel it's important to remember that the school board is still recommending a two-part plan that also includes the renovation of our 35-year-old high school. It is currently in your hands to decide whether you or the voters will decide on the importance of this addition. We've provided all the additional information to show both the need to return the kindergarten space back to the high school and the need for addition, an addition to accommodate the long-term need of classrooms at Pond Cove. While we debate the future needs of Pond Cove, our high school will only get older with an increased frequency of system failures and repairs that will drain our maintenance budget. Delaying this renovation will only increase the costs overall later. I urge the council to remember that we will need to take some sort of action on this building sooner rather than later. While it was the school board that recommended this two-part plan, it was not our first choice. We reluctantly decided to phase our recommendation of the two projects so that we could minimize the tax impact and remain sensitive to the economic conditions. We also ask that the town council and our community members remember that the school board did not choose to support the two, they did choose to support the two least expensive proposals that came before us from the building advisory committee. Every effort has been made to fiscally, to be fiscally responsible while addressing the, the, these two very real needs. Last month we came before you to ask for support on these two projects. Tonight, Tom and Marie have provided further answers to many of the counselors and citizens' questions. You're going to hear comments from the public. And once again, we're going to ask the town council to agree, in principle, to the need for both the Pond Cove addition and the high school renovation. That being said, our recommendation to the town council would be to bond the Pond Cove addition for the spring of 2003 and then have us work together as two elected governing bodies determine the best timeline and the venue in which to address the high school. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, counselors. My name is Cindy Garfield of Abaco Drive. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I'd like to start by thanking the School Building Com Advisory Committee, whose three years of work has culminated in a very fiscally responsible building program recommendation. I also applaud the town manager's recent $420,000 budget cuts. Tonight, I'm here to show my support for the Con Cove edition. First, I'll discuss the long-term nature of our challenge. Then I'll discuss the lease versus buy option. <coughs> Leasing is a solution for a short-term problem. I'm not convinced that our space problem is short-term. I'd like to address this decision quantitatively. I analyzed the planning decision consultant's population forecast completed in 2000, which is based on projecting future growth rates based on historical growth rates from 1991 to 2000. We already have updated information on that, but what I wanted to point out was that even under their best fit model, which shows pure population growth only, no new homes, uh, in migration and births, their, their figures were off by 4%, their forecast two years ago versus actual. So there is a margin of error even two years out. I would conjecture that 10 years out, the margin of error is even greater, as was confirmed tonight. I would, I'm suggesting that the high projection is the most realistic, because we do have new home construction now. We have not seen a building boom the likes of what we're in the midst of since Stonegate was built approximately 13 years ago. The current building boom includes 90 new homes at Cross Hill and 35 new Fitzpatrick homes in various developments. 
less than half of these homes are occupied yet. We have not felt the impact on enrollment yet, and I'm not sure whether all the lots, the um, building permits have actually come into our figures. Then if you look back over the 10 years before Cross Hill uh, came into being, we had 24 houses per year that were squeezed into larger lots somehow. <laughs> so we're talking about an additional 11 houses over our historical 10-year trend. So I would only question that uh, 11 house um, error. Cross Hill has 90 lots, less than half are built. Um, I have moved into a new development myself. Two years ago, these 125 house lots that I just described did not exist in the town's housing inventory. These four bedroom home developments are attracting families from out of town with an average of two children each based on my field research. I live on a new road, Abaco Drive, where there are 12 new homes of 20 children, six of whom are preschool aged. All of the families but one moved from other towns because of our superior school system. If we project 125 new homes at a conservative one child each, then we need seven new classrooms system-wide. The point is that there will be a significant impact. We can't ignore it. I predict that we'll have another elementary school enrollment bubble in five years like we did in 1994, around the time that Stonegate was built and people moved in with their preschoolers. I'd like to take just one more minute with some historical perspective. I attended Cape Elizabeth schools from 1971 to 1983. My class size was 135 students, which is right in line with the average class size in the 90s. At that time, the kindergarten was in the Methodist church, and we had two elementary schools. If over the past 30 years, the kindergarten has only been able to have been housed in Pond Cove for less than half of this time, this shows that we've needed a kindergarten for a long time. <laughs> in the 80s, the high school was fully occupied. All the classrooms were occupied by high school students. We had approximately 540 students at that time. We had reasonable class sizes. And we did not have special needs students, as many as we have now. And we only had a dozen or so Apple computers. The consultant's high model shows average high school enrollment, the same average level of the 540 students through 2011 that there were in 1983. So it seems like the building you know, fits the need. Um, the point is that the high school needs to reclaim its space permanently. The consultant's report shows the K-4 population dropping by 31 students or 5% over the next 10 years. This drop is within their margin of error. Given the current new housing development, it's hard to believe that there would be underutilized space at Pond Cove in 10 years. It's clear we need the additional space and that it is a long-term need. On the issue of lease versus build, I would like to highlight to my fellow taxpayers that the difference between the cost of portable classrooms versus a permanent structure is only $53,000 more per year for the first five years. I will close with three reasons for acting now to approve the school addition. This is a long-term, not a short-term need. The portables would still be there in 10 years after their useful life, like they are in many communities. And we need to do it now, approve it this spring, so that construction can begin in the fall, and we can save the cost of that one year of renting the portables. Thank you very much. I appreciate your service to the town. My name is Barbara Schenkel, and I live on Belfield Road. Is that better? Shorty. Um, I, I'm neither going to support nor not support. That's up to you. I'm going to urge real fiscal restraint. Not everybody in this town has kindergarten children, and many of us feel very strongly that the schools need to be extremely good. However, sometimes we go overboard on things. I'm not saying that we don't need to move the kindergarten, but when I look at the figures, and I'll just use one of the figures that Marie gave. And I'd like to say I think the school board and the committee has done a really difficult and wonderful job in trying to resolve this. Even if all of us may not agree with everything, I think it's been a great job. Um, if you look at some of the numbers that we just received tonight, for example, in 2009 and 2010, the projection is that there will be 97 to 109 kindergartners, the same figures, for 2010 and 2011. Using the maximum state recommended amount of 18 students in a classroom, you come up with 108. And yet we say 108 students for six classrooms, I mean three classrooms, six sessions. 
so I don't need, know why we need a fourth classroom for one child. That's difficult for me. And that's projecting out to 2010, 2011, using the new numbers that we just received tonight. Uh, if we only need three classrooms to make things work, then perhaps we should consider building three, cla three classrooms for successions. All I'm asking the council to do is please look at everything very carefully, including the number of houses that might consider it conceivably be built. I think we may see a slowdown because of the economy and the number of houses that may be built in the next five or ten years. Uh, and urge you to show restraint in how you make this decision about what we do and, and where we go with it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Could we have people not be applauding for everybody? Or it, it, thank you. It sounds, it sounds bad over the... You know, the applauding sounds... You don't know what sounds really bad over the people who are trying to listen to on the television. And if everybody applauded for 10 seconds after every one of you people spoke, we'd be adding several sections of time on to your public hearing. So I know it's hard. <clears throat> you can start again. <laughs> My name is Gwyneth McGuire, and I live on Old Colony Lane. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for allowing me to voice my opinion about this issue. Cape Elizabeth has been very fortunate to have had a prosperous past. Like many communities, we have exp expanded, improved, and built facilities to bring and keep Cape Elizabeth up to date. Our whole community, as well as the school system, has benefited greatly from the foresight of the town council, the school board, and our citizens. I have read the mailing that the school board sent and out and study the problem on my own, gathering information to become more informed so that I could participate in this public meeting. There is no easy solution. It will be impossible to satisfy everyone. I have come to the conclusion that sacrifices must be made by all, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, the teachers of our school, and our students. I am willing to make the necessary sacrifices by paying higher taxes to ensure that Cape Elizabeth upholds the school department's claim that Cape Elizabeth public schools have become one of the top public school systems in the United States by creating a dynamic organization that inspires an upbeat, innovative, and collaborative environment that results in a high level of learning and achievement for all. However, the school board, if the school board truly re recognizes the strain on the Cape Elizabeth taxpayer, they would not recommend a plan that benefits or serves only part of our school community and expect support from the citizens. It is for this reason that I am against the two-part plan proposed by the school board. It is essential that we address the needs of the entire school community. I agree that there are major problems with the kindergarten being housed in high school. It isolates the kindergartners from the rest of the elementary school community it eliminates the possibility of social interaction with older elementary school children who could aid in the kindergarten learning process. Hmm. Thus, there is no opportunity for a collaborative teaching between grade levels. It can lead to a more difficult adjustment to the first grade when kindergartners go to the Palm Cove school as they are not familiar with the building. There are also safety issues. The school population is segregated because there are def different developmental stages. It is inappropriate for young children to be in the same environment as young adults. <laughs> Lastly, it is inconvenient for parents who have to pick up their children from two different locations at the same time. That would also be true at the Hamlin School, just so you guys know that. <laughs> there must be a way to house our kindergarten students with the rest of the elementary school population in the current Pond Cove building by consolidating or sharing space or through the use of portals. Yes, I agree this might not be the most popular solution, but it does achieve the goal of having all the elementary school students learning in the same location, a kindergarten through fourth grade school. A feasible option, as projections of growth, depending on what model you use, indicate that the elementary population will level off to approximately 100, 550 students or 155 students that are currently enrolled. And that's from the school board information that was sent to our home. So that's where I got that number. As the school board flyer states, school buildings are a reflection of the community's value of education. They preserve our home values, serve our whole community, and they are good value for ta all taxpayers. The value we are placing on education is solely on the elementary level. 
by not updating, renovating, or repairing our high school, we are telling our whole community, our citizens, our high school students, and our high school te teachers, that we do not value their education as much as we value the education of our elementary students. The motto for the school is, a high level of student learning, quality teaching, and support of a community. How is this being achieved at the high school level if we do not provide the best opportunity for our young adults to achieve their fullest potential with updated and renovated educational facilities? By delaying the consideration of the renovation of the high school and building an addition to the Palm Cove, the needs of the entire school community will not be met. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sue Pierce, and I have served on the Facilities Planning and Building Advisory Committee. I support the school board's recommended proposal to first build at Pond Cove Addition. The committee in no way is saying that the high school renovation is less important. By doing the um, kindergarten first, this opens space, much needed space, for the high school. And we phase it in that then we build the addition and the next step would be to renovate the high school. It is a $9 million proposal in front of the town council, phased in $1.5 million in September, or tonight, hopefully. <laughs> um, of the three options being discussed tonight, in addition, Hamlin School and Portland cl Portable Classrooms, I believe an addition is the only permanent solution to our long-term space problem. I would like to address the proposal to purchase, lease, or share South Portland's <coughs> Hamlin School. Even before learning tonight just how expensive Hamlin would be for our town, obvious practical, logistical, and fiscal problems came to mind. For instance, when special services were needed, would students be bused the nearly six-mile round trip to Pond Cove? If we house our kindergarten and first grade at Hamlin, as suggested, what do we do about the fact that Hamlin is three, four, or four classrooms shy of the 10 or 11 needed by those two grades? Doesn't a four-room addition to our own building make more sense than a 43-year-old building in another town? We already have our own building, our own 35-year-old building to renovate, the high school. And the thought of having our five-year-old kindergartners sharing space with South Portland municipal workers is beyond me. The new enrollment projections don't change the basic fact. We do not and will not have space for all of our elementary grades, kindergarten through fourth, at Pond Cove. This is the same as with the old numbers that were presented. We never had the space. What the new projections do show is that in three years, the middle school will not have the space to accommodate Pond Cove overflow. I strongly agree with the school board's commitment to a K through 4 elementary school, 5 through 8 middle school, and a 9 through 12 high school. We should not be looking at portables as a short-term fix for our long-term problem. A mistake addressed in an article written by Michael Roman of Modular Building Institute, a trade association that rep represents, ironically, manufacturers of portable classrooms. The problem with temporary portables, he writes, is that all too often a perceived short-term require, requirement turns out to be long-term. This fiscal blunder is even worse if the classroom is leased rather than owned. Capital funds are not made available because the need for additional space was deemed temporary and thus of a lower priority. The seemingly endless complaints about inferior classroom trailers will continue as long as the portables are an afterthought brought in to offer a short-term solution. Let's not fall into the situation that Mr. Roman describes. And please, let's not make our school facilities where over 1,700 children are educated a low priority for our town. We need to address our long-term space problem with a permanent solution and in an addition, and to avoid portables and save almost $100,000, we need to start construction by late summer so it will be ready by the fall of 2004 when our kindergartners will be moved out of the high school. I know that this is the prob probably the worst time to bring forth a school building proposal, followed next year by a major renovation to the high school. But the timing is what it is. We will only spend more money in the long run 
if we don't face our schools facilities problems today and move ahead with the recommended school board plan thank you thank you my name is maria was a cow ski gilder lane i don't have a prepared statement but i do have a couple of items that i was hoping that either the council or someone from the school board could clarify for me um... the first is it was my understanding at least that with the move of community services to the new building that there would be a roll up of space available that the middle school would be able to take back over then pond cove would be able to take over middle school space can someone please explain what has happened with that that's my first question um... second question would be um... there's a total uh... basement area in the new community services building is that space that could be used in lieu of portable classrooms for that one room uh... one year um... you know maybe they can be adapted for kindergarten use um... and my third point just went right out of my head <laughs> but maybe you could work on answering or addressing those two for me while i i think probably the best thing to do is to have marie respond to you privately afterwards rather than getting into back and forth a debate and questioning we'll never get through the public hearing I think the public might want to know the answer to what happened to what happened to the three classrooms the four oh, classrooms marie do you want to answer that then yes. all right um, the, the space that community services vacated this fall we are currently using one classroom for health another classroom for accelerated language arts there is a smaller classroom which all of our world language teachers in the middle school occupy and the office space that community services had we have our curriculum coordinator in that space a professional library that all three schools are using and conference areas the, if you're familiar with the kitchen area that was part of community services we now use that as a life skills area for um, special education students so every inch of space that community services vacated we are presently <coughs> using in middle school I think thank you Did you misunderstand? No, that's the second Okay, um, the, we were not, a, that was investigated um, in terms of moving the kindergarten to that lower level space. Uh, we cannot do that because of um, uh, ac access, egress and, and access issues. So we cannot have classrooms there. Thank you, Marie. My name is Joe Gatchel. I live on Belfield Road, Cape Elizabeth. Come May, I'll celebrate number 59. <laughs> and I received a uh, letter here. It says, why a citizen, or as a citizen, should I support this building project? I've lived in Cape Elizabeth uh, pretty much all those 59 years. May I see them? And the, the May 25th birthday. And I've seen all the ups and downs of school buildings and debates and so forth. Many of us here either went to Cape schools, have children in Cape schools, had children in Cape schools, may have grandchildren who will be or may already be in Cape schools. And I'm sure we're all citizens who are concerned about the school. The opening line says, school buildings are a reflection of the community's value of education. And I found the statement offensive. In 59 years, I cannot believe, if you look across the street, if you knew what went on in this building for school, if you knew about Cottage Farm School, if you knew about the old Pond Cove School, the citizens of this town have always supported the school. And calling a building a reflection is really not the issue. 
what is the issue is the quality of the education mm -hmm. and what goes on inside the building. Really, this statement brought me here, and I encourage the debate to think about the cost and the alternatives. And frankly, as this display of space was evolving and the projections for the future of what we need for school space, you know Hamlin School looks better all the time. I also encourage the school board and the town to become broader in their thinking and begin to discuss alternatives not only within the town but with the adjacent towns of South Portland and Scarborough. Because I think at some point in time we're going to be building heavy and one community's population in the school may go down while the other community goes up and the efficiency and economics of it all may be more effective if we cooperate with one another. It seems in this day and age of fluctuating economies and so forth that it would be a good direction at least to look into it for this town, the adjacent towns, and the taxpayers of the town and also the citizens who have children or will have children in the town. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Judy Simons, living on 18 Brentwood Road for 32 years. And obviously, I'm in the minority. And these are the reasons. I cannot support the Cape Board's request to build a $1.5 million wing to house the Cape's kindergarten program for the year of 2004 and on for the following reasons. Right now, we are witnessing a weak economy, the loss of jobs, more household debt, record fuel prices, and an enormous cost of an impending war. Cape Elizabeth has always been proud of its excellent school system and values its education as one of the prime reasons for living here. However, adding to our debt burden, which already includes paying for a new public work building, renovations on the new police building, renovations to the swimming pool, additions to the middle and Pond Cove schools, buying and renovating community services building, maintaining the strong athletic programs in their various fields, as well as all the public buildings, this is not the time to add to our tax burden. If I understand correctly, we are losing $486,000 in state aid, <coughs> plus an additional loss in revenues of miscellaneous sources of $203,000. The town manager, in order to keep the tax rate from increasing more than 2%, is cutting $424,020 from town services which includes $6,600 from the library. There goes the very popular and successful children's program. Jenny Hannigan and I have served together on a former school board. We have always kept our interest in the, state, in the Cape schools and appreciate the tough decisions school boards have to make. Because of the board's request for 1.5 million kindergarten wing, we took the opportunity to visit and tour South Portland's Hamlin School. It's scheduled to close the fall of 200-2003. Thinking this is a possible alternative to house Cape Kindergarten is suggested by Jack Roberts in the South Portland City Manager. The $1.5 million request will cost the town $2,173,000 or the life of a 20-year bond. Hamlin School more than meets the kindergarten needs. It even offers the opportunity for a full-day kindergarten program with its seven classrooms. At this time of cutbacks and rising taxes, we need to take time to seek alternatives, such as leasing or buying the Hamlin School, finding other unused space, and maybe combining some of the classes in the middle school. 
The governor announced in the paper he's willing to build incentives into state aid formulas for creative and innovative ideas. Let's join the other towns around us, Cumberland, Falmouth, Yarmouth, North Yarmouth, Freeport, Portland, and South Portland, all are going through similar budget cuts. cuts. Please hold on the proposal of the kindergarten wing and put it on the back burner. I recommend the town council table the proposal until the school board can look into these other alternatives, including the use of the Hamlin School. Let's give the retired people, many who have served the town on its various boards and commissions and now living on a limited income, as well as young families struggling with household debt, a break from adding to the property taxes. Lastly, I thank the school board members as well as the town council members for their willingness and time to serve the town. I know it's a tough job, at times a thankless job. Thank you for your commitments. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ingrid Stressinger. I live on Fowler Road, and I'm also a teacher at Pond Cove. I currently teach fourth grade. Um, I just wanted to bring a little history that I have. I haven't been in the school system for a long time. I um, was uh, teaching kindergarten when it first moved to the high school, so I've been through that. And I remember at that time when I was teaching kindergarten in the high school going to a public meeting at which uh, former superintendent uh, Connie Goldman was discussing the proposed uh, Nelson Stun renovations to Pond Cove and the middle schools. And I realized on the floor plan that I was looking at that there was no space plan for kindergarten. And being a kindergarten teacher, it was a natural question, why not? And according to the superintendent at that time, uh, based on projections in five years, there would be enough room at Pond Cove to move the kindergarten back. Now, here it is 11 years later, we don't have any room at all to bring the kindergarten back. So I would really caution anybody looking at projections to think about just how accurate they might be. Um, it's been a long time. I personally feel it's time to have the uh, kindergarten through fourth grade together in one permanent structure. Um, I feel that there is, uh, commenting on something that was said earlier, uh, maybe there are not a, a lot of available lots right now, but there's a lot of undeveloped land in Cape Elizabeth. Should someone choose to sell it to a developer, we could see a lot more houses going on in this town. I think a striking example is on Pleasant Hill Road. We've all seen what happened to Pleasant Hill Gardens. It makes me very sad every time I drive by there and see the huge development that's gone in there. There's a lot of land like that in Cape Elizabeth that could be sold to development and we could see a lot more houses um, suggested for building here. Um, I also would suggest that with uh, construction costs and interest rates being substantially lower now than we've seen them in many years, and in fact about half of what they were when the uh, remodeling was done to Pond Cove in the middle school, that this might be an opportune time to have the project done. Um, and finally, I would just like to uh, close my comments by asking for a show of hands from the teachers who have come here tonight um, from Cape Elizabeth to share uh, their support for the building project. So if there are any teachers in the audience would please raise their hands to show the level of support there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And council members, residents. I'm Frank Potenzo, 8 Ivy Road. I say fools rush in what angels fear to tread. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all alone. I have no bodyguards with me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll protect you, Frank. I'm retired. And I'm joining the growing number of other retirees in Cape Elizabeth. This month, coincidentally, marks 45 years that I've lived in Cape Elizabeth in the same house. I raised three children that went through the Cape system. None of them live in Cape because they can't afford it. I'm taking a quote from a book entitled Tale of Two Cities using poetic license, I hope. This is the best of times and the worst of times. 
Cape Elizabeth is a wonderful town. Fine people, lovely homes, great scenery, many recreational facilities, fine schools, and town administration. However, this is a crucial time of high costs, food, gas, oil, health care, and high property taxes. This is the lull before the storm, like World War I, all quiet on the Western Front. I was in World War II, not World War I. <laughs> Looming on the horizon, the revaluation of properties in Cape Elizabeth. The figures were known tonight as to the new property values and the increase in property taxes. I wonder how the residents of Cape Elizabeth would vote to spend another 1.5 million, actually 2.5 plus million over 20 years on for an addition, one story, for kindergarten kids. I called the high school a few days ago and asked for the number of kindergarten kids enrolled and they told me 104. The superintendent's letter that was mailed out to all the residents in Cape only mentioned 1.5 million with no mention of actually 2.5 plus million with a 20-year bond. I agree with Councillor Cayeta. Her statement in the March 1st issue of the Cape Courier that building a one-story addition is a long-term solution to a relatively short-term problem. Since school enrollment is projected to decline by 180 students in the near future. Is this like the Battle of the Bulge in World War II? Even an option to purchase or lease portable classrooms is not the answer for a short-term problem of school enrollment. This would be an increase in property taxes. One solution to take care of the bulge is to increase the size of classrooms for a few years and continue with the kindergarten in the one wing of the school of the high school. Another solution is to temporarily lease or rent Hamlin School for the kindergarten. The only thing I read about Hamlin School was that there was a possibility if an agreement could be made between Cape and South Portland to lease it or rent it. And I've heard tonight that progress has been made considerably further than the knowledge I had that is a possibility. The bus goes right by the school, it's a short distance away, and <clears throat> there are no big high school kids around, so they'll be safe and sound. This might help both South Portland and Cape Elizabeth minimize education costs. The bottom line is no more spending for new school buildings. Approximately only 20% of the residents in Cape Elizabeth have children in school. Maybe it's 25%, but I heard 20%. And when you figure that 85% of the mill rate of taxes we pay goes towards school education, that doesn't leave much for the town to fiddle with to take care of streets and potholes and maintenance and removing ice and sand trucks and whatever. So presently, residents of Cape Elizabeth are facing another request by the school board. I thought that this meeting tonight concerning the 1.5 million, or as I say, 2.5 million addition came up because option A, which was a 9.37 million for high school needs or wants, and option B, 7.53, 
million for high school needs or wants, which was awarded down of option A. The town council voted to delay those, and that's why we're talking about 1.5 million addition, or as I said, 2.5. I'm almost through. This is a crucial time of budget deficits and already high property taxes. The state of Maine is very unfair to the town of Cape Elizabeth yeah. and little or no general purpose aid True. for education. There's an excellent article in yesterday's paper. I think the reporter who wrote it was, uh, uh, was uh, named Egan. And it's called Wealthier Communities Penalized by the State. I hope you all read it in yesterday's paper. It's true. The town council must put the school board request on hold. <coughs> this present request for 1.5 million one-story building should not go to referendum in November 19, uh, 2003. It could be a repeat of past history when the November 93, 19.4 million school project was voted affirmative on the referendum by only 184 votes. At that time, 100 new residents registered Cape Elizabeth and 153 absentee ballots were registered by college students who didn't own or pay property taxes in Cape Elizabeth. So there's a little bit of danger by holding this off until November, because earlier, for a show of hands, everybody and his brother in here says, we want that addition to the Pond Cove School. I've said it before at opening hearing meetings that there are three kinds of people in the world. People who watch things happen, people who make things happen, and the people who wonder what happened. <laughs> I add a fourth to that. People don't care. People who don't care what happens. <laughs> Retired people in Cape Elizabeth care what happens. And it's getting harder and harder to cope with rising property taxes. There are very little pay raises in Social Security and pensions. And also, the residents don't like it when the homestead exemption is decreased and the veterans exemption also is decreased. These cuts on exemptions just contribute to more property taxes to pay on high evaluation of their property. So it's like another tax added on. I wonder how Dagwood Bumpstead has survived over these years without getting his eternal plea for a pay raise. My comments are like dropping a pebble in the water causing ripples to form in the hopes of those ripples turning into waves of protest for any more school building and renovations resulting in higher property taxes. We already have enough new buildings now. It's already stated. Police department, fire department, maintenance renovated, paint building renovated, Probably my words won't be worth a dime, and somehow that addition would be built, but I, I hope not. I hope not. I've got, got the curb. It's, it's, uh, revenue is one thing, deficits are another thing, but spending money facing a revaluation when we don't know just how much more residents are going to have to pay in property taxes. 
And uh, Mr. Potenzo, you need, do need to sum up. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't think he needs a bodyguard. He looks like he's, he could still take me out. <laughs> um, Robert Chatfield, 22 Beacon Lane. Uh, I'm actually here to speak against a spring referendum with the uh, uncertainty within the state budget and the revaluation in this town, I really don't think the voters would have a clear concept of how this would impact them. I don't think they'd have all the facts. So I think uh, a spring referendum is actually the worst of all possible solutions for this. Um, I, I think that said, the decision probably likely really should rest with this council and regardless of what your decision is, I would respect that decision. Uh, I have a child who will be entering kindergarten in the year 2005. I know that the key to the success in his education is going to be parental involvement. Regardless of where he's housed, I plan to be there. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have been asked if we would please enforce the three minute rule also, and we're going to need to, we're not going to get through this this evening, so please, you're going to need to limit your comments to the three minutes. Or... Okay. My name's Laura McGrath, I live at Four Heritage Court. We moved to Cape Elizabeth because of its excellent school system. I support the addition on Pond Cove. I feel the alternatives voiced tonight, such as portables and busing kids to a South Portland location, are short-term solutions to a problem that, according to the demographics, is just going to continue. The idea of separating some of the fourth graders from their peers and placing them in the middle school is unacceptable, but I think because of the new numbers that wouldn't be done anyway. The school board and the building committee were charged with the task of determining our school space needs. They have spent three years on this analysis. I think we need to support their decision and do, do this the right way and build the space that is needed. I think as a society, we love to talk about how important our children are and how important schools are. But when it comes time to make difficult budget decisions to support these supposed values, other things seem to become more important. And during strong economic times, it's easy to take high ethical grounds and do the right thing. But when the economy is faltering, schools seem to take the biggest hits. I think it's challenging to persuade those without children in the schools that these dollars are spent wisely. But my argument is simply that it's a social obligation. And I understand, just having heard the opponent's arguments tonight, I completely sympathize and understand them. But I think we can't escape this, this space issue. And we have, I just, I'm not a Band-Aid type person. I think it's a philosophy I have that just, let's just solve it the right way. Let's just do it right the first time. And it ends up being financially more responsible in the long run. Sometimes it's those investments that are the, le the least tangible that have the greatest value. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Chris Lynch, Shore Road. Um, I hadn't planned on speaking tonight. Uh, I, I don't have the perspective of most of the people in the room, uh, relatively new in town, and as I was listening to what people had to say, I realized we were the problem. Uh, we have four kids, three in Pond Cove, <laughs> uh, actually one in the satellite uh, kindergarten, and I will say that, it, that if they weren't getting jettisoned from the kindergarten, I wouldn't be here. Um, I think that worked out fine. I think the, the teachers did a fabulous job in integrating them into the bus system, into the into what was going on. It's not perfect, but it wasn't bad, and the high school kids were terrific. Um, that said, you know, I agree that it's clearly, and, and not in any particular order, I just made notes as people went through, is it, it's definitely the worst of times, but I was shocked to learn that they've been there for 10 years. And it seems to me that to come up today in March and say, well, we don't want to do a June referendum when the kindergarten's been out of the grammar school for 10 years, it seems like they, they were at least nine years to think about it and educate the population out there. Um, the, you know, as far as the Hamlin School goes, when I first heard about it, you know, with, with no offense to anyone, I mean, that's just, I just think that's, it's, it's where we don't allow our kids to say. And, and I heard uh, Mr. Porcell or Dr. Porcell say that, you know, it's not cost effective. If it were free to bus our kids into South Portland, I, I just don't think, particularly with the, uh, with the kindergarten kids and for families who have multiple kids in the school system, it's just impossible. It doesn't really make any sense. Part of the beauty of the system we have here is everything that's geographically convenient, the high school next to the middle school next to it. It's a great design, and to move away from it, even temporarily, in my view, is, is a mistake. Um, I certainly support uh, some of the comments that were made earlier, and that, that the Yarmouth example is a good example. It's only going to get more expensive. At the outset, one of the counselors pointed out that we should really add on the cost of the first year of temporary uh, schooling, even if we do go with the, the new wing, because you'll add that cost. Which you failed to mention, we should not add on the cost of the, the whole new wing in addition to the, the temporary solution as well. So it's all about present value dollars. It's, the money has to be spent. It's just, it hasn't been spent in the last 10 years. It's just a question of 
when is someone going to raise their hand and say, well, we need to do it now, we need to deal with it. It's only going to get more expensive. It's going to get more expensive for the retirees. It's going to get more expensive for the people in the, uh, in the school systems, with kids in the school systems as well. Fiscal restraint, as I said, I think that's important. I don't think that's a problem. It seems like this is a group that supports restraint. Um, and, and there was one comment that, that I thought was particularly telling, which is the quality of the education is what goes in, on inside the building. And, and I think that is important. But I think taking kids out of the building is, is where you diminish that quality of education. And so with that, I strongly support it, um, building the wing. I also support the high school renovation very strongly. I'm sorry, and I heard someone say that the school board compromised that position, which I'm disappointed they did. And I know it's a lot of hard work to reach that, to get to where they got to, but it's one that I strongly support both going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Peggy Hunter, and I live on 67 Columbus Road. And I'm not on any committee here. I'm just um, a mom. I have four children. I moved here for the school system four years ago with one, and now we have four. I have two children. <laughs> I've been busy. <laughs> I have the year that we're talking about, that the, the kindergarten will move, I will have two kindergartners coming in that year. I'll also have a fourth grader that year. Um, I have two children with special needs. I, they will continue. They've received uh, special uh, services now, and they will continue to need them when they come to kindergarten and through their school services. And I am so against having them go to Hamlin School and having my child have to either be bused to see the special ed person that is at, you know, at pulling them away. First of all, they're going to need an occupational therapy room which requires special equipment, which re requires, you know, that specialist to work with them. And um, I'm just really against them being farther away from, uh, you know, and, and we moved from South Portland, so they wouldn't have to go to school there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I really don't want them to go to South Portland schools. That's why we moved here, because these are better schools. And I would like to see the continuing excellence in schools. I mean, this problem has gone on a long time. It's going to continue to, um, to exist, and the longer we wait, the more expensive it will be. And short-term solutions that you think that enrollments will go down. I mean, I, I may not be done yet. I might have 10 <laughs> by the end. And maybe there's other crazy people like me that love kids and want to have six or seven kids. There's two children. Maybe every single person that moves into Cross Hill or wherever will be crazy like me and have six or seven children. So I would like to mention that that two family or even one family per, you know, one child per family, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not our family. So, um, you know, like Mr. Lynch that before us, we're part of the problem. We're going to continue to be part of the problem. <laughs> and it's not going to be fixed short term. So I, I really support um, both the kindergarten um, you know, kindergarten addition and also the high school renovations. And um, I would like to see it at least go to referendum so that everybody can have a chance to give their views. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Stephen LaValle, Brentwood Road. And uh, I thank the school committee and the town councilors for their uh, volunteer time. I just want to say that I think it's a common sense solution to a problem that has gone on for a long time. And I think we can argue with the numbers. Um, anecdotally, uh, I was in the moving industry for 14 years, moved a variety of people here. And people are moving here because of the schools. And the majority of folks um, that I had the privilege to move uh, were young families and coming here because of the school system um, and not other towns with, quote, uh, more affordable housing. Um, my concern is that we go, uh, I guess maybe the easy route, and go to referendum. And my feeling is if that happens, uh, the folks we see here will be very motivated to go out and it will pass. My concern is that it's going to cost an extra $100,000 or $200,000 if that happens. And I'd like to see a vote, I believe, if not this council, um, there's precedence in that we've voted for multi-million dollar projects without going out to a referendum, uh, i.e. the new buildings we've been hearing about that um, have not impacted my life at all. 
Um, <laughs> fort fortunately. So I, w I would love to see a vote tonight. I'd love to see it be a positive vote. And uh, I think a referendum is really just putting off, again, a decade-old problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Kelly Hassan. I'm team leader for the first grade um, at Ponco School. Obviously, I am for the kindergarten wing being built on Pond Cove. And I'm not going to reiterate the eloquent arguments that I think people have made for it. But I wanted to just bring forth very briefly um, something I think that everyone needs to consider in terms of projections beyond just enrollment projections and home building projections. Um, as probably everyone in this room is aware of, within the next decade, there's going to be a mass shift in terms of retirement and trying to attract quality new teachers into the field of education. And if we are going to be losing teachers because of this retirement over the next decade, we're going to be in heavy competition with other schools around Maine to attract quality teachers, the best and the brightest. And I think if we are not upholding our, that the best things that we can do in terms of our facilities, in terms of our opportunities to give teachers time to collaborate together, I think we're really jeopardizing the bottom line, and that's going to be quality instruction. And if we jeopardize that, we're going to have a lot bigger problem than just maintaining our facilities. And if we keep shifting students around from, from school to school and thinking this is going to be temporary, and of course the kindergarten, it, it's, been, it's been a 10-year ordeal for them, and which has been unfortunate, and I, I don't think it was anyone's projections, but I do believe that the projections of the teacher shortages are there. And um, Dave Silvernail, who heads the, it's late, you know, University of Southern Maine Education and Policy Research Center, um, has all the figures. I'm happy to get them for you. But it might give you um, some more things to consider in terms of what we need to think of in terms of keeping the quality of education in Cape Elizabeth high. So I, I was not planning on speaking tonight, but on behalf of all the teachers at Pond Cove, I urge you to build it, and we promise you they will come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Desen. I live on Ivy Road. I'm also on the school board, but um, really the only thing I wanted to point out tonight is something that Frank referenced, um, which is as of the 2000 census, Roughly 48% of this town is either a child K-12 or the parent of a child K-12. And that is something, this 20% of, only 20% of the people in town have children in the school system. I just, if I hear it one more time, I'm going to scream. So basically, half of our town is either K-12 or the parent of a child K-12. That doesn't count kids that go to private school, and it doesn't count kids below pre in preschool. So anyway, I just wanted that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Shedd, and I reside at 6 Linwood Street in Cape Elizabeth. I'm, I'm also the principal of the high school. Um, in two years, the high school is going to have a population increase of about 50 students. Um, Personally, I love to have the kindergartners in high school. It's a lot of fun. It adds a dimension. I had an added advantage last year in that my son was actually there. That's an advantage that I am the only person in the town who had, but I had it. Um, but in two years, we are going to be going up by 50. And I see this renovation as, uh, or this addition as a step in the direction of the eventual renovation of the high school, where when it rains outside, it rains inside. Um, where our art and music rooms are inadequate to serve the number of kids who want to take the courses that we offer and that are very popular, where our science labs are outdated, our special services rooms are very poorly suited to the uses that they have, the cafeteria is too small for the numbers of students so that students sit in the hallways of the school, um, and we have woefully inadequate parking uh, for the regular school days, let alone for the many special events at the school. I will only say that I'd urge the town council to adopt a decision, a solution, as expeditiously as possible, and that is in the best long-term interests of the school. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. 
Hi, my name is Mary Delano. I'm also a resident of Ivy Road, which seems to be very well represented tonight. <laughs> I'm a member of the building committee and I volunteered to serve on the committee because I'm a lawyer and I primarily practice construction law. So I thought I had something that I could offer to the committee. Um, and one of the things that I want you to think about as we deal with the dollars here are that the school jobs that are going out to bid now are coming in under budget on the bids. It's a very competitive time in the construction industry because there's not a lot of new work out there. Mm. And you will get more bang for your dollar now than you will in two or three years. I can assure you of that. Uh, Bob Howe, the architect who has left, has been on a couple of projects in South Portland where the, the bids came in significantly under budget, which is very unusual. And I would urge you to really think about that as you factor in the economy, because while a slow economy creates a lot of problems, it also creates opportunities. And one of the opportunities it creates is to get more value for your construction dollar. I know that the construction firms that are bidding on schoolwork now are some of the best firms in the state. That won't necessarily be true when the economy improves. Those firms will often go on to more lucrative commercial work. So I would strongly suggest that you think about what you can get for your dollar now and think about approving this measure now so that we can get underway with the building and we don't have to have portables in place while we get this construction done. Thank you. Hi, um, Diane Nicholson, 243 Mitchell Road. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for letting us come here and speak tonight. Um, I have been on the building committee and the building advisory committee, whatever it is, whatever it's been called for the last three years. Um, I'm here tonight because it was our concerns over the last three years of what our schools needed. Um, based on the economic times, it was our best thought that we should come to you and only ask for $1.5 million for the kindergartners. I think a lot of people have expressed why we need that. I'm not going to go into that. Um, I did want to address um, that when, when we started looking at this as the facilities committee, we looked at all three schools. All three schools had space problems. Um, and somebody brought up something about the middle school space. The reason we are not up here talking about middle school space right now is because community services moved out and gave them the space they need. So middle school was, although they still had needs, their space needs for classrooms was taken care of. So now we have um, Hong Kong and we have the high school. I have been on this committee for three years, like I said. I am here tonight. I am working for, this, for the kindergartners because that's what we're trying to do, or I think we should try and do right now. In three years, when we're back here talking about the high school, I'm going to be just committed and I'm going to be up here. You know, if I have to be on another committee for another three years, well, this is where I'm going to be. I don't think that as a town we're committed more towards kindergartners than we are towards high schoolers or any way around. Um, I think we're all here for what's best for our kids and the best for our town. Um, I did want to bring that up. The other thing, I wanted to bring up a couple other things, is that um, as a couple other people spoke as um, members of large families, um, I've always had a problem with planning decisions numbers, and not because of the number of households in town, but because of um, what I see happening to families. And I think I emailed most of the counselors and I um, just out of my preschool, I let you know what percentage, I think it was, um, and I'm guessing now, oh, I don't even want to say, because I'm guessing. There was a high percentage of, of families that have more than three children. Um, and as I think I said in my email, there's a lot of those families that are very young families. Maybe they only have one child now, maybe they only have two children, but that doesn't mean they're done. And I think that um, our space needs are going to continue to be an issue if this kindergarten wing isn't built because there may not be more families coming into town, but there's going to be more children in the families that are there. Um, and um, lastly, I would just like to say that I did um, circulate a petition, and I have 66 signatures, I'm going to give it to, um, of people who are Thank you. Um, thank you, and I'll probably see you in two or three years when we're doing it. <laughs> thank you. I don't know. Hi, um, my name is Susan Steinman. I live at 10 Woodcrest Road. Um, I am also a member of the school board. My family moved here 
um, from California 11 years ago. We drove into Portland, asked a realtor, where are the good schools? And we were appointed to three different towns. We, we chose Cape Elizabeth. Um, for us, education was a priority. I worked full time at Unum because if I weren't working full time, we couldn't have afforded to live in this community. And it was important for us to do that. And um, I will, after three years, be going off the school board to go back to work full time to support my kids being in school in this community. Tonight, I went to my, um, my youngest child's uh, orientation at the high school. So um, we are in the process of kind of moving on. Um, but, but it's been our decision. We were glad to be here. I first want to say it's great to see a room full of people who still have their natural hair color. <laughs> I, I can see new parents coming in. My message is that um, my message is that I really do think school buildings are a reflection of a community's value of education, and um, I do have concerns. I think historically, Cape Elizabeth has done a great job with its school buildings and, and attracting the best and the brightest. I do. Um, I have some concerns, though. In 1995-1996, according to the State Department of Education, of schools with K-12 with over 500 pupils which there are 95 in the state, um, Cape Elizabeth raged, ranked fourth in per-pupil spending. Since then, 2001-2002, we have slipped from fourth to 30th in 95 school districts in what we spend per pupil, which is kind of the standard measurement of what a, a community invests in, in its education. Um, that's one concern. The other is that in a town that has state-of-the-art transfer station, public works, police departments, outstanding school system in Greenbelt, these programs are expensive, and they are going to continue to be expensive. And it's not, it's not a recession, and it will continue to be a fixed income issue. And I think we are at the end of being able to say we've got to cut costs, hold costs down. I think we need to get visionary. And it's a challenge for leaders in every sector of this town to start to get creative as to how we are going to support these state-of-the-art services. Costs will never go down. They will only go up. And, and it's not about the recession. It's about um, just the cost of living. And I think we need to get creative. It can't be the same old, same old. We'll cut here, we'll cut there. We've got to start getting, dig down deep. There are some great minds in this town and come up with some new ideas. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the facts, but I don't stand in line very well. My name is Peter Eastman, Woodland Road and Turkey Hill Farm. Uh, I taught 20 years at SMVTI. No deference to my friend Bill back here. Uh, we had plastic from the ceiling down into the water fountain. I'm used to leaky rooms. <laughs> uh, granted, it's not the building that uh, values the education, but those good teachers have to have a roof over their head, and uh, you need you need structure. Uh, to answer Ms. Carson's comment over there. Where are you going to get the land to put the houses? I've got 25 acres and it's developed. I know you water. do, Peter. <laughs> but I can guarantee there's not going to be a bulldozer going through it. I know, Peter. <laughs> I'm also working with the Cape Land Trust and stuff like that. And I don't ever want to see a bulldozer go through that. Uh, some of the comments tonight, the better you make your education, the worse you make your problem because you get more people in town for that education. Uh, some of our direct relationship there. I don't know. I'm not recommending that you devalue it, uh, but I think perhaps I will continue on to make my major annual contributions to Planned Parenthood. <laughs> I don't read for last night. Uh, uh, well, I hate, I hate to be the last one up, but uh, I thought I'd represent Cross Hill. I, I live on Cross Hill. <laughs> My name is uh, Andrew Steinberg. Uh, we just, my wife and I just built, and you know we're we're new to town, so I can't assume to know the history of everything that's gone on. You need to speak I, into the mic. I can I can only say by a very un uh, unscientific polling that we see tons of kids in town. Uh, our neighbors, <clears throat> our neighbors moved three children from Connecticut. Uh, my wife and I have a newborn daughter. We're from New Jersey. Uh, people across the street, two kids from South Portland. Um, she, my wife just met someone in a baby class this morning that uh, lives in the neighborhood. They moved the child from Wakefield, Massachusetts. Um, we're seeing a lot of children and there are a lot of young children. It, it just seems that uh, 
you know, the number of children are growing and perhaps there's not going to be another development such as Cross Hill, but we, we see lots of kids and, and as you say, there's lots of houses to be built. We see four houses within sight of our house that are being built now. I mean, these are just families like ourselves, young families that are, that are moving into these houses and, um, you know, we moved to this town. We, we moved from New Jersey for a, a safe and sane um, lifestyle. We moved here for the education of our children. We built a house that uh, we realized was going to be more expensive to build in this town. We realized we pay more in property taxes to live in this town. And we did so because we felt that education would be a, a strong asset uh, in this town. We, we plan on living here for a long time and we plan on having more children. So uh, I, I'm certainly for the idea of moving forward sooner, not later. And uh, to me, the idea of portable classrooms uh, is just not the way to educate children. I mean, it, it, it really should be done in a more permanent solutions such as building the, you know, the addition that we're talking about. I, I'm all for going forward as soon as possible. Thank you. Hi, my name is Byron Castro and I live at 29 Valley Road. I've been a resident of Cape Elizabeth for about 33 years. Um, I, I kind of have a little upset about this is a kindergarten issue. It isn't a kindergarten issue. It's going to affect more than just the kindergarten. It's going to affect the third and fourth grade. They're going to realize that they're going to be moving out of their classroom. Um, it's just, and it's becoming this issue. It's also a high school issue because as we grow, one way or the other, there's going to be some classrooms vacated. They're going to be, have to be moved somewhere. So I, you know, I hear this kindergarten wing. I've seen Kate Elizabeth move around quite a bit. We've never run out of space. I mean, we've always needed space in this town. The only time I've known we closed one building for school was Cottage Farms, I think in all the years I've been here. So, I mean, we have always need more space. And for population uh, growth numbers and stuff, I mean, if we don't build any more buildings, we still have buildings that have, and I'm, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, we have older generations that turn. My parents are moving out, they want to they move into a smaller house and stuff there's going to always be a change of population in this town. It may grow for new buildings, it may be changing, just the generation change all the time. There's always a generation change. But I just thought, you know, I hear all these numbers, we really don't know what to predict, but we'll never, never have enough room, no matter what we do in this town. We always need it. We found out with the fire department, we found out with the police department, we found out with the community center. We're always going to need more special education, Everything. When, when I was in high school, we had a computer room about the size of where a desk is. Today, that is an insult, and obviously we don't, we grow. We used to have the industrial arts. We don't even have that in the school anymore. Our home ec, all those rooms have been taken out. They were a whole wing in the high school, and they're not there now. So we're always going to need those rooms. If one thing changes, we're always going to put something else in need of them. Um, I'm just... I'm sorry, I only took quick notes while I was there. Um, I just can't see putting in portable, portable classrooms. I think it's just a waste of money. That we're always going to need this space. We're just taking more bad money and throwing it into something we're just not going to use. We need to have a good building for kids to be in. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Betsy Moyer. I live on Webster Farm Road, and I don't have a prepared speech with me. I'm not as articulate as I wish I were, but I'll do my best. I'm here as a parent volunteer. I've been an active parent volunteer in all three schools since my daughter entered kindergarten in 1992. The first year, the kindergarten was down in the high school. And in my years volunteering in all the schools with just lots of dedicated teachers and administrators, I can tell you that I don't see wasted money. You know, they do, the, they just get an incredible bang for the buck. And we're all, we're all really blessed to have such good people uh, running things and teaching our children. And we need, you know, I, I believe that it's not a waste of money 
to um, add a kindergarten wing on Pond Cove. As, as has already been said, it will not only help the kindergarten kids, it will help the rest of Pond Cove, it will help the high school. And, you know, I don't, I don't see them wasting money building, you know, fancy buildings with fancy brickwork or anything like that. I think they've cut things to the bone and, you know, that's basically my feeling. Please support the addition. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? I'm Terry Ann Scriven. I live at 1 Granite Ridge Road. I've been in town for 10 years. And as I listened to the debate and listened to earlier hearings and discussion about this issue, I wonder how you as town council members can with a clear conscience say no to the school board. I think about what decisions have been made in this town in the last 10 years in terms of building, inviting new people into the town by making those lots available and increasing the school age population as well as the natural processes that um, a former s uh, speaker had mentioned. <laughs> but I wonder how you can, with a clear conscience, say no to the needs of the schools when the school board and the building committee have carefully looked at this problem for a long time. There's evidence that there has been an issue that's been there for 10 years and then turn around and say no to funding when it is a problem that has been created by our town policy as well as natural population growth. I would encourage you to approve and recommend to you that you fund what is needed in the schools. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tim Thompson. I live at Six Pine Ridge Road. Uh, my perspective on this, I guess I'm a, a father of five. And <laughs> it's something in the water, I think. <laughs> but uh, I, so at one point I had children, Ponco, middle school, high school, and, and college. Now I have a couple in college. So I'm, I'm very sensitive about this, and I know a lot of seniors, I, I play golf over for Pudic with Frank, and I understand the dilemma. Um, but at the same time, uh, and I remember when we were moving kids into the high school, the I had a couple kids that were gonna be in that kindergarten group that was gonna be put in the high school. And we had these sessions to calm the parents of those children about how, what a good deal this was going to be. Yeah. It actually turned out to be a pretty okay thing. But it, the perspective, I guess, is that I would probably have children that started kindergarten in the high school and may end up in the high school. So uh, that building they're pretty comfortable with. Um, <laughs> but it is one of those, it's like when we're talking about these portables, they start out as a temporary solution. The town uh, is very creative. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, we're, we're going to be in studies because we have such good people in your positions. And that's a, very, that's a real tribute to our town. So I'm confident, and, and I, I hope some of these young parents with the young kids will be confident that we will get the right decision. I'm, uh, I'm very confident in our school administrators, uh, between Dr. Fursella and all of his staff, all the Tom uh, Eismeyer and Nancy Hutton, uh, Mr. Shedd, they've studied this, um, they know what we need. I'd like to go through the whole project uh, and do it all at one time. I know that's fiscally, uh, even, even the, the committee is saying uh, they're willing to do this in a step process. But one of the, re one of the reasons we came, and, and you talk to parents that come to this town, it's at least one of the top reasons why they come to this town is our schools. My property values are higher than many of the communities around because one of the reasons is because of our schools. And I think it's, it's an investment. Uh, you see the kids go on to college from these uh, and go on to the tech schools or wherever they go. They're going on into life and doing very well. They're very prepared because of our, our schools and the, and the teachers they've got. And I'd just like to continue to, to see the town make the kind of wise decisions that they've made over the many years and uh, continue in that excellence. 
Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Are we going to end it on that note? All right. I see somebody moving now. All right, we'll close the public session and I'll ask what the wishes of the council might be. Pardon? You want to take a break? Did you three minutes a break or not? No. Um, I thought yeah. I could. That's, that's the item is over, yeah. I didn't know if you'd heard Penny. That's mm. You can wait three minutes? That's what I was asking for. It's yeah. all right. All right. What are the wishes of the council? You want to take a break for three minutes? Or you want to take that before we... Yeah. Never mind. No, I'd rather wait. Never mind. We'll take no break. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get, we'll get to one quickly, Betty. <laughs> well, I'll make a motion. All right, good. Um, well, I'd, I'd, first of all, I'd like to um, thank everybody for uh, taking the time to share your views on the school building project. I've had, um, well, through 6 p.m. today, I didn't get to the ones after 6 p.m., but I've had 57 emails and letters um, for the addition. I had another 13 that were against it, and the people for the addition um, spoke in their letters of all different ways of being for it. Some, some were also in favor of Hamlin School. Some, were in fa some people who were against it were against it because they wanted their kids to stay at the high school. There was a, quite a wide spectrum and variety of opinion. But um, I have read all those and I believe I've responded to every single one um, that, I, that I got by email at least. I haven't responded to letters because I just haven't had time. Um, that, those 57 emails represent 5.4% of the school families. Most of them were from parents. Um, that's 5.4% of the school families, um, which is the same as 1.6% of the households in town. Um, and I just want to let you know, I really appreciate your willingness to let us know of what your priorities are for the town and the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, because it's important for the, the democratic process. So after hearing all the input and looking at all the data, I want to let you know I support moving the kindergarten to Pond Cove. The question, I think, is how to do so in the best way um, for the school system, for the students, for the schools, for all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. Tom Fursella said at the beginning of this meeting that he thinks the town council should have all the data before making a decision, and I think that's a wise way to make the decision. I think the town council needs some time to look at the new data that we got tonight from the schools on cost and enrollment. It was an excellent um, presentation, Marie, but my eyes are going and I'm not sure I was absorbing the, the four pages of numbers and all the, the maps and stuff. I think we need to still get some missing information on maintenance, moving, bonding costs and some other costs like that. I think we need to receive the final complete written report from the building committee and the school board which lays out their recommendations, plans and rationale. I think we need to evaluate the fiscal impacts of the various options and lastly I think it's really important that we try to digest everything that the public has said to us over the last week and then tonight. Only then can we have all the data, as Tom says, and decide what is the best course of action. So over the next three or four months a lot can happen with the budget, with the economy, the state and national economy, with a war that may be happening, with enrollment, <coughs> with other new data. I think there's no compelling reason to make any immediate decision tonight. Um, the whole reason this hearing was scheduled for March for tonight was so that there would be enough time to get a referendum question onto the May ballot. However, the school board has changed their, rec changed their recommendation at our last meeting and decided that they would prefer, if it went to referendum, that that referendum be in November. I think a September town council decision would give plenty of time to give the referendum question on the November ballot, and therefore I move that the council defer any final decisions on the school board's building recommendations until our September 2003 town council meeting. That will give plenty of time to get all the missing data to understand it, to evaluate it, and make a measured, well-informed, and timely decision on what is best for the schools and for the community on this very important issue. I second that motion. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Uh, yes. Councilor Lynch? I have some discussion, and I'm wondering if I can ask a question of the school board with respect to the September date, and I've spoken to um, Ann about this issue. 
And the question I have is September, if we voted in September, does that give you adequate time um, to go forward for a November election? I realize that it is enough time to get on the ballot. Marie, you, would you, either of you care to go to the podium perhaps? To the rationale for, um, for holding off this spring was because if, if at this late date to be able to educate the community, and we know that uh, with the close vote that occurred in the last building project, that we would need significant time to make sure that we got out to all those seniors, that we got out to all the citizens, uh, so that people would really understand the project. Even listening this evening, there were people that came up to speak that obviously had some misinformation. So we need to get accurate information out. That does take some time. If we didn't know until September uh, for a November vote, I don't think that would give us time. All we need from the council is if in the spring we knew whether this is something that was going to referendum in November, it would give us time to put together um, our, our campaign to get out to the community. Um, the very reason we don't want to go in May is um, we didn't know when this decision would come and just get a couple of months to do that to go through that process is not enough time. Could I ask a process uh, question sure. regarding a public hearing? If, if the council, if the council decided, Mike, if the council decided to put this to referendum in November, <clears throat> when would we have to hold? Would we, would we have to hold? A, I presume we have to hold another public hearing. Public hearing. Correct. Yes, you do. You would have to hold a public hearing um, that is in the uh, state statute, and you would have to do it at a regular or at a scheduled council meeting. Um, presumably, you would the count. You could ha hold it at any time. Traditionally, for these things, they were held, you know, held in October. So you would have to set the public hearing at your September meeting for October. Right. What What's the earliest we could? Uh, is there a a you maximum can do it. number? Could no, you can do it when you want. This we have it in August, in other words. Could we have could the public hearing we've had tonight? I would, qualify I would say not. Referendum. It was not intended to be um, for you know a referendum vote. Okay. No, it doesn't I, have a dollar sign attached to what we did tonight. Right. So I think that yeah. folks haven't seen language to what the um, question would be. Uh, no, I, w I would not consider this that. So that if I could just ask, so when, if, if it were going to be on a November ballot, b backing, backing up, when yeah. the, latest, the, the public hearing? The, the public hearing you, you would need would to have be before in the election. Would be in October. You would could be. presumably I mean, have it in October. In order right. to get the absentees and so forth, we would need to know at your September meeting. Um, you have it you know, July. final verding it. Final we, we have a meeting in so July. And have a public hearing in September and then final wording hmm. and final figures, so that the folks would know exactly what the, the public hearing is for, exactly what the, the intended is, is that they would the public would have an opportunity to state what they feel, you know, by by the um, the vote by the uh, I'm sorry by the wording. <coughs> Depending on when you can get that together. All right, and the. I, I mean, the question I have is whether a July public hearing is a good time. No, but we could set the public hearing in July for September when people are now back from vacations and, right. and that would move it up a month for them, for the school board anyway. Right. And then you know well, how it was mm. going to be on the ballot. Mm. All, we, um. all we would need to know from the council is if, mm. if you approve of the referendum and holding a referendum in November, then as soon as we can know that, um, then it would give us that opportunity. If, if this process begins in September and then there's a hearing and we still don't know whether there's even going to be a referendum until 30 days before the referendum, that just doesn't give us time uh, to put together any kind of an, ed an education campaign. All right. I think what we need to do then, um, would you be, Anne, would you be prepared to back it up like a month from, September, from the uh, September to like an August so we could give them that month that they needed? Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I, think, yeah. I think Penny's suggestion of 
um, doing it, making a decision of to whether to want to send it to referendum in July is fine because okay. that would give plenty of time. Um, but to set the public hearing in September, I think, would be better. I think it would be in the school department's interest just because mm. people are on vacation and stuff in well, August and school would be in session in September and I would think you'd want to be able to have parents who were more likely to be around August, I think. You don't usually even have a, a school board meeting in August, do you? Or I can't remember. Okay. I, uh, but I still, I still think that it would be better to, for us to to set a, a public hearing in, to make the decision in July to have the hearing in September, because I really think August would be not in the school board's interests to, you know, after school starts, I think would be. That would so work. Would you, All right. So I would me amend my, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I would amend my um, timing of that. I'd um, uh, say that uh, my motion would be to defer a decision um, on whether or not it goes, to, well, to make no final decisions on whether it goes to referendum or, or whatever um, until July, set that, those, that decision making period for July. And if we wanted to then set a public hearing, if that's the course, the way we wanted to go, to do it we to have August. Um, and I, have I mean, to September. As to why we would have to wait four months from now to <laughs> <laughs> I, if I could address that, well, I think it would be really a bad idea and would not be prudent at all to make a decision about potentially almost three million dollars, whether whether or not that's a good idea or not to endorse sending it to referendum when we don't even have the data, since we just got it today. Uh, so I, I think it would be um, getting ahead of ourselves. Frankly, we we. Our information is incomplete, so I don't see how we can make any sort of decision on any of it. Council of Cass. At this point, I, I, I'm certainly not not holding to July. I mean, we could may, maybe do it in much sooner than that. It, it seems inappropriate to make that we haven't even got our budget. We don't even have your budget. We don't have anybody's. We don't have any budget. I mean, for us to sit here as elected people and say, well, I don't know what the budget is and I don't know what the spending is, but let's spend it. We 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 need to. But we could do it. Our budget process is beginning. We're going to be meeting constantly, you know, in the next couple of months. And so July is not any magic month. Maybe it should be uh, um, May, you know, where we could do that. But let's get all the information. Let's get the report. Let's see that we, you know, let's go th start our budget process. Let's get the school board budget. I think that any of you would think that we would be crazy to make a decision we don't even know what the budget is for next year. We don't even know what the tax implications are. So I, I would think that you would sit there and say, I think they're making a prudent decision to wait till we get the budgets anyway. I mean, that, that seems like a reasonable thing. You do that in your houses, and we will do that in our community. So July is no magic time, and neither is September, but I, I know that the more time you have, the better. And I think the sooner we could address it, that would be fine. Maybe it's May, maybe it's June 1st meeting. That'll maybe help. I'll amend my second. I think that would be acceptable Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. So, I think so we have a motion on the table. Well, I would. Then you amended I, I amended it for July. A, a logistical question. Um, the doubt. Do you need, uh, if you were to vote outright for it, like other buildings have been done in town, do you need another public hearing? No. Or do you only need another public hearing if you were to send it to referendum? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I believe it's the latter. We don't have the numbers. I'd want to reread a town attorney's opinion of a year and a half ago that I haven't read lately that indicated that the council had the right to set it for a public hearing if, if, and for referendum vote if they decided. I'd want to take guidance there and not try to answer that this evening. But, but to, to the other part of the question is, is there a public hearing, for example, was it required for all the other buildings? No, that wasn't a question. I'm okay. just saying the council has the right to vote yay or nay right now on whether to build this building. What I was asking was if, if Deb made it sound as if it goes to referendum, they needed another public hearing. Hmm. What I was asking, do. and that's correct, right? What I was asking is, if you did take a vote, yay or nay, 
do you need another public hearing on just approving the project and moving forward without the referendum? I'd stand by what I said before. I'd want to reread re that town attorney's opinion. <laughs> so, Jack, so I, I, I would amend my original motion to, su to say July to deal with the decisions because that would... Do this is it's not an open <laughs> debate here. Um, I think at that point we will have the budget data. I think we will have a chance to have meetings with the enrollment people. We will have a chance to look at all the data that has been presented to us tonight. We have a lot of other issues to deal with in the municipal budget. And so I think that would give five months before the election to, to educate the public. And I, I frankly think that people won't be thinking about fall issues until the fall comes too much. So, right. Did we have a second? You are amending that? All right. Then any further discussion from council? The, the motion is that we would uh, try to come up with a decision in July. And if we are going to put it out to the public, do a referendum, the school we would vote on that. The school board would be notified, and they would have that amount of time then to to, to you know, try to enlist their support for the project. So, and who had the second on that, uh, Lieutenant? Rick, are you willing to accept hands amended? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yes. Councillor Lynch. I just wanted to also take the opportunity to thank all of you who come and who've written and like. Councillor Carson, if I haven't responded to you, I have read it, and I will try in the next uh, few weeks or years <laughs> to get back to all of you because um, there's been a lot of good discussion about this. Um, this is a difficult issue. No one wants to pay more taxes. We're heavily reliant on the homeowner for most of our tax dollars. We have little sources of other revenue outside of the property tax to support schools and municipal needs. With three parks, much of the town's property is tax exempt, putting an even heavier burden on our homeowners. Our town manager and our school department have been sensitive to these pressures and I believe have acted with fiscal prudence over the years. Based on information provided to the council by the town manager in October, Cape Elizabeth's taxes, when compared to other towns on a full value basis, are lower than Falmouth, Yarmouth, Gorham, Scarborough, South Portland, and Portland. It is with that last fact in mind that I have concluded that it's time to move on these projects. I favor finding a permanent home for the kindergarten and for moving the kindergarten up to Pond Cove. It's a move that's long past due and I wasn't even aware that the kindergarten was at the Methodist Church. <laughs> With the benefit of hindsight, it should have been done when the Pond Cove edition was done in the early 1990s. I do not support the Hamlin School idea. While well-intentioned, it is flawed. By the time we pay for a nurse, a janitor, a secretary, additional photocopy machines and other resources, not to mention additional bus runs, it's more expensive than either the portable or the new wing options. At the end of 20 years, we will have nothing to show for our money, while with the new wing, we will at least have a fully paid for asset of the town. Furthermore, as the parent of three children in three schools, mm -hmm. afternoon pickup at dismissal and extracurricular activities is a challenge. I can only imagine how, how much more difficult it will be if we add a fourth location in a different town to the mix. I do not support portables as a permanent solution, but I note that by asking the council for a school building referendum in November instead of May, the school board has necessarily made portables part of the equation. And um, Dr. Frisella has discussed tonight um, how they would envision using portables. Based on his information, I'm willing to consider portables as a possible temporary short-term solution based on cash flow considerations or doubt about the expected growth rate in the schools. The projected growth rate may, and I want to emphasize, may determine whether space needs at Pond Cove are short or long-term. 
I think we need to look at the information that Marie Prager has given us tonight and see if we can't come to some agreement between the school board and the town council on what the proper population projection is. If that information suggests that growth will continue, then I believe we should build the kindergarten wing. If there's doubt, and considering that we have already been put on the portable path by the school board for the first year, then a short period of two or three years won't matter to the children in the long run. Cash flow is another issue. We're facing a $465,000 cut in state aid to our schools. We've yet to complete work on the municipal side of the budget. We haven't even seen the school budget. We haven't completed work on whether there are other sources of revenue available to the town besides the property tax. I don't believe we've yet heard the worst from Augusta, and I wouldn't be surprised if we face even greater cuts. I think that we very likely will be in a position where we have to choose between bricks and mortar and school programs with respect to the kindergarten and portables. So I think as a cash flow matter, in order to preserve programs and teaching staff, we may need to consider portables for the short term. As a parent of a child who spent the third grade in portables, I can say that his experience educationally was not marred in any way. What we remember most was his wonderful teacher, Allison Hawks. Program cuts will be much more harmful in the long run than any short-term reliance on portables. The high school, on the other hand, is 35 years old and needs major renovation. While some things like lighted ball fields can be put on hold, much of the work is associated with renovating a 35-year-old building. Anyone who's purchased a home of that age knows that renovation is necessary. I think we need to be clear, and the public needs to be clear about the relative priorities of the project. I would plan to vote tonight to put the kindergarten um, out to referendum in November, um, but I will vote to defer any decision because the school board has given us the new population information tonight, in which we've seen for the first time. I believe we should have a chance to thoughtfully consider that information. So I feel it's in the schools and the children's best interest to bring the kindergarten up to Pond Cove. I think we need to have a better understanding of the demographics, and I really hope that both bodies can work together on that. And um, I take to heart what uh, Mary Delano said earlier about construction and interest rates, and um, hope that we will, in the short term, be able to um, work on this. Thank you. Any other councillors? Councillor Carson? I, I just was going to say a short, I had a long thing prepared, but I think it's short is better. And, and um, you know, we've had these, the kindergartens there for a long time. My, my major in college was human growth and development, and I eventually, it's, of all the seven or eight jobs I've had, one of them was teaching, and I taught in the kindergarten program. Five-year-olds are so focused on themselves and their new exciting life, and they they are overstimulated in our society and in other ways. And having those children down there at that high school program has really worked out very well. We had a wonderful presentation from, from seventh graders uh, about the school issues that they did on their new laptop computers. And I leaned over and I said, guess what? All those terrific kids that were speaking in front of us all went to kindergarten in the high school. So probably educationally, they are not damaged. They have themselves, they're with each other. And the best of all possible worlds, it would be wonderful to have the kindergarten program up with the other elementary school. There's no question about that. And you can't look at the council and say that we don't understand that, because of course we understand that. And, and we receive so many letters that say, you don't understand uh, that the good schools mean better property values. Well, of course we understand that. We're not <laughs> complete imbeciles. We know that the property values are good in this town because we have a good education system, and we have voted year after year after year in my 15 budget votes, to support schools. Always supported schools. So it's, you can't say to us, oh, we don't care about schools. Of course we care about schools. But we have seven people who are here to represent 9,000. And there were 60 of you here, and you spoke passionately about what you believe, as you should. 
and when your kids get into fifth grade, you're going to speak passionately about what goes on in fifth grade and then in seventh grade because that's the way we are. We are passionate about our children and about our education and we will get on board and we will get involved in every level of the children. So we understand that and we're sympathetic to that. We've had children that have gone through the Capes Elizabeth schools. We were just saying that three of the counselors have had children who were educated here and then they were educated in portable school rooms in our school's department. So we're not, you know, we're not, it's not that we don't know anything, it's that we are trying to prudently weigh so many different things, including a war and gas and oil and electricity and all those other things, and fixed income people. We have a lot of retired people in this community. There is just no question about it. And you know, I, was, I think I was telling the council that one day in the grocery store, a young person who I didn't know and, and didn't get, give me their name, Asked, talked to me a bit about the schools and said, and I said something like quickly, well, we have a lot of fixed income people. We need to represent everybody. She said, what exactly is a fixed income? And so here are some young people who are going lickety split. They got kids, they got activities, they got their cars, they got their houses, they got a really busy life. And then you have people in our community who are fixed their income at $100 a year, whatever the figure is, $100 a year, and that's what they expected. And now the economy's gone to blazes and their income is now $80 a year, and they have to figure out how to live with that. So it is important when we raise taxes. It does mean something to some people. And uh, we have done it year after year, and I've provided some, some, some figures that we got before about the cost of living increases, that the cost of living, living increases, we've had all those every year, and we have consistently supported the school several percentage points every year above cost of living. So we do support schools. I do believe that the kindergarten is best if it would be up with the, with the Pond Cove School. I don't believe educationally that the children have been hurt because if they had been hurt, we wouldn't have left them there before. You people would have been here, or those parents who had kindergarten kids would have been here before to talk to us about it. So we are going to do our best. We are going to try and do this procedurally properly. And we want to have all the information to make a really good decision. And we hope we can make a decision that, will make, that you'll think that we gave it a very thoughtful approach, whichever the decision is that we make. So I, I am glad to have another couple of months with the more information that we can weigh that and answer the questions with information for those other people who don't want the addition. They want information too. When we have it all, we can answer everybody's point of view. So we're just going to do our best, and I hope you'll give us credit for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councilor Fritz. Well, I, I want to make it short as well. A lot of good comments have been made that I, I agree with. And I, as others, I, I um, very much appreciate <coughs> getting emails. Um, and I haven't had a chance to answer them all. I had like 267 oh. when I got back from a week and a half away. So I haven't quite made it, but it, they, will, they will all be read and, and answered. Um, I. I think the enrollment figures are the toughest thing to grasp um, here. I, I served on the um, 1980, approximately, comprehensive plan that we had for this town. And at that time, we were saying that enrollment figures were going way down, and everybody across the region was closing the wonderful neighborhood schools that people really liked. And, and it was not long after that that we the schools closed, and, and then we were realizing that the enrollments were going up again. And, and it really is a problem to grasp. But I, I think we have to understand them um, before we can just plunge ahead with building and, and building something permanent. I do think that the uh, kindergarten should be at the Pine Cove School. I just want to understand the best way to do that. The Hamlin issue came along, and, and I think it's, it's very worthwhile exploring. Every time we've gotten together with the school board in the last couple of years, I have suggested, let's, you know, have you explored issues with neighboring towns? And I, I think it gets more urgent all the time um, that we do that. So I want to know about the Hamlin School and, and what, um, what might work out there, but I'm, I have a feeling that portables are, are a more likely thing. I, I really have not heard any arguments so far um, that there's anything wrong with portable classrooms. Uh, I wouldn't like to see the kids going out in the middle of the winter without some covered 
walkways, but, you know, with, I went to a portable school, I, uh, you know, classroom, and I did go outside <laughs> um, to get to the classroom, and, and I really don't think that the education is any worse in that situation. But I think mainly we need more information, and um, because we have a variety of people in this community to consider, and, and it may be a good time to build because uh, interest rates are low, but that means that people on fixed incomes income is lower. Um, so there's a lot to consider. Thank you very much. Councillor McGinty. I certainly can't add much more. Um, that side of the uh, council has been very eloquent about uh, all our concerns. Um, a couple of things. <clears throat> I, I would like to emphasize for the people who um, suggested that we, uh, if we were going to send this referendum, we send it the spring. That was the request of the school board that we put that off until the fall, and if we were going to send the referendum, well, not. The issue was the timeline. To clear that up, the, the timeline we were given by the by the town manager was we were we asked what what would we have to do to have a spring referendum, and we followed that timeline to a T. It got to that February meeting where we thought a decision was going to be made, and we were told no, there has to be a public hearing and things got postponed. So our goal was, and the only reason to have a spring referendum, the only reason it changed, is the initial information we were given, through no one's fault, I guess, was just inaccurate. So that's, we were kind of forced into that situation. But at this time, you, would, you wouldn't support? Not now, we just don't have time to plan for Okay, it. that's the point I'm trying to make. But you could still vote for it, but... Um, I, I do believe that we, we do need all the information. I'd like to see the final report from the building committee with all the background information from them. Um, <clears throat> also, these enrollment figures, I, I, I go back and I say if the figures are wrong in 2000, what, what makes, why do we think they're right today? And now they're saying there's a 20%, a you know, 10% plus or minus. That's a pretty big swing. So, again, I'd like to see the background. You said, Marie, you'd offer that information. I'd like to see that also. Um, and <clears throat> um, I'm going to support the motion because I think that uh, if we do it in July or thereabouts or even before that, if we have the information, uh, that'll give um, the, the school board and uh, uh, Dr. Fasella enough time to uh, strategize for this um, if we decide to send the referendum. Um, also, um, I can emphasize with Mr. Castro, I don't know if he's still here um, about never having enough enough room. Um, that's that's probably true. I th I think I'm the only town councilor went K through 12 here in, in town, and this was my fifth grade classroom right here. I mean this was it. They put up some partitions and that's where I went to fifth grade right here. So, and I do remember my teacher Mrs. Schubert, and she was a great teacher. So I guess when you have good teachers, you remember that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, so I, I will support this um, to to put off the decision making until. Uh, until July or thereabouts. Thank you. Councillor Berry? I think they've uh, all said it about uh, all of the points that I was going to make, so uh, I, I yeah. think we should have the uh, information that we need to make an informed judgment, and we'll try to do the best we can. I Thank think. you. And just an added piece of uh, trivia to follow up, Councillor McGinty, in isolating kindergarten children, this was my kindergarten classroom. So. Things have changed in this town. We were isolated from all the schools. We had neighborhood schools in, but the kindergarten was here, and I, I guess I made it through college. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And That's what made it the way we are today, right? <laughs> about everything has been said, and I'm not going to try to reiterate it, but I, well, I brought forward the idea of the uh, Hamlin School, uh, basically for the regionalism approach to it. I'm not married to the idea at all. It was something I thought should be explored um, to see if it was fiscally uh, sound, if it could be educationally sound, and I asked the school department to look into that and get back to us. That was, that was all there was to that proposal. Um, and I think there's still some information we need on that as well, but as, along with all the other ones, like I said, we also chipped in on their school stories. My son was in a portable over at the middle school at one point when they had the, the roof problems. And I kept telling everybody I wanted to go to see a portable because I'd never seen one. I'd forgotten that he'd even been in one. So <laughs> the, a lot of the portables are not that bad. And I'm not, and again, I'm, I'm not suggesting we go that route, but uh, you hear all these horror stories about portables, and obviously they're not that bad. So. But with that, I would call the question. Mm -hmm. All in favor of uh, the motion as it stands?
being shown to be unanimous. Thank you for your patience, your comments, and we appreciate everybody coming. We'll take a 10 minute recess. John? I have multiple notes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, move. I never got my photo. Moving right along. Uh, <laughs> one means item number 930203, receipt of the municipal and special funds budgets. It is recommended that the manager propose budgets be referred to the finance committee. Uh, second on that, perhaps? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor? <laughs> Did the town, man any comment on the town that manager have any not. comment on it? I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> Item number 94. I, if I might, very, very briefly, uh, I, I was looking at some mail earlier here, and there's a couple of comments complaining about uh, some of the proposed reductions. And what I would encourage is anyone that has any suggestions on the council, in the community, either that they don't like my reductions, uh, that they suggest other reductions to take the, those, the place of those, uh, or any other suggestions uh, that they might have anywhere in the budget. We're always looking for ideas, and you know, I don't agree with most of the things that I did anyway, so <laughs> I won't take offense to anyone who criticizes them. So I think you know, if did. anyone has a better suggestion and, or a better idea than what I came up with, uh, I would welcome it. So. Can, right, can we you. also use this opportunity to this. remind the public that we have a public forum mm -hmm. on the budget, March, Thirty first on the agenda. That is on the bottom agenda. We okay. will be. Yes. But I thought since we were talking about budget and cuts, this will be an opportunity for the public to come and express any concerns they have on those cuts. We're doing things a little differently. We'll get their input at the beginning of the budget instead of the end of the process. But we will also have a public hearing well, at the end too. That's right. It's just an additional opportunity to give input at the beginning. And just to clarify for those watching, since we don't have much of an audience anymore, <coughs> um, it, that's to give input on any aspect of the municipal budget, the community services budget, the county budget, our assessment for the county budget, or the school the budget. school budget. It's the entire the whole town shebang. budget. I, I realize that there's no, the, none of the school board members here, but when can we expect to get the school budget, Mike? Do you have any idea? Is there a the, the, the budget schedule has a date. I don't. Did anyone have their budget book with them? Didn't bring it with them. Yeah. 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 It's on the deadline it's section on the back there. Under the deadlines. School budget to town council. Is there a date next to that? April 14th. April 14th. It's okay. not consistent with our March meeting. Wow. A month from now. April 14th. I thought it was done. Two weeks after. I thought. Yeah, I thought this. No, are they still having workshops? I may not have any judgment, but I'm against If I might, Mr. Chairman. May as well. We've, we've dropped all protocols already. <laughs> my, under, my understanding is the school budget won't vote to recommend a budget until their regular April meeting. They're, at this oh. point, they're working on, on uh, it as, as a finance committee, and it'll go back to the full school board, and the school board will need a formal meeting to make a recommendation to the council. That's why the timing of it is such. Thank you. All right. Can I move on to the next item? Yeah. Nope. Okay. Well, I, I'm just wondering if, if um, I haven't gotten any schedule of meetings that the school board is having on the budget. I don't know if they had it. anyone knows of them or if anybody in, in they the They had school, one last Saturday, I believe, their all-day one. Their all-day one was already. I believe that one yeah. last Saturday. Yeah. I would ask the town manager if he could check with the uh, superintendent and forward that to us. I will, I'll speak with Wendy Derzewick too about posting it very prominently on the website, both the municipal and the school budget meetings so that uh, everyone is aware of it. Thank you. All right. Item number 940203, annual dog warrant. And it is recommended the town council approve the annual dog warrant. Do I have a motion? So I have a dog. Second. I'll second the motion. I think we have a move and a second and over here on the left. Um, <laughs> no, we're the right wingers. Any, uh, any discussion? 
I have one comment, and I know I'm going to be in the minority on this, but I want to say it, and I'll keep it brief. But I find that the dog tax is uh, extremely discriminatory. I'm looking over at our budget, <laughs> and we have spent uh, almost $2,000 of a $1,500 budget this year, and those costs come primarily from uh, felines as opposed to canines. The, uh, a cat that is picked up True. must be taken to the veterinary. Yeah. It must be proved to be healthy before it can be taken to the vet or uh, to the pound. Given its shots, and, and it costs almost $200 per animal that's picked up. And if the animal is ill, it has to be put down, and the town absorbs that cost. Also, the because we do not license the felines like we do the, the a canine. There is no control that they're having their rabies shots, uh, and that is a potential health hazard to the community. I realize the town can't do much, and it's a legislative issue, but I want to at least go on record here. I think that, we, that it should be something that be, should be pursued. Um, and I am by no means, no means at all uh, promoting civil disobedience. I have two dogs. I've paid my fees. They were paid on time kind of like the Cumberland County budget where we all voted not to, not to approve it, but we ought up paying it anyway. So I've had my say um, to say it's a discriminatory tax against the dog owners and the, and the, the cats that are costing us the money. So for what it's worth, all in favor. I, I just have to say I, I tend to agree with you, but I'm still going to vote for the dog ward. <laughs> That's a McGinty. No, oh, okay. All in, <laughs> we voted. All in favor? <laughs> all opposed? Uh, I, no, on a serious note, that, mm -hmm. is that a state law mm -hmm. as far as the dog licensing yeah. versus mm -hmm. the feline? Mm -hmm. yeah. It is, and ever yeah. since I've been a municipal clerk for over 17 years now, it has gone before every legislated <laughs> or le uh, legislature, every legislative committee. I can't tell you how many hot, sticky rooms I've sat in with every <laughs> animal activist group and <laughs> everyone else to do with this issue, and no legislature has been presented a bill that, that really meets all those needs, and I'm not going to go into all the reasons why. Well, they but want to do licensed cats? I'm sorry? They want to license cats? There are some groups that do for the reasons that uh, Chairman Roberts just stated, okay. but then there are opposing sides, and, and so again, it, it's never come to be so far. Peter forever. So, moving on. Uh, I, I think that's something, if we're going to license cats, we ought to do it on a regional basis, and it ought, be, <laughs> ought to be done at a general assistance Big office county. in South Portland. <laughs> Have a county tax for it. A county cat tax, okay. An item number 950203, Mountain View Park Sewer Improvements. It is recommended that two count... It is recommended that... The, I suppose that should be, the council approved the award of a bid for sewer improvements on Island View Road and Mountain View Road, and I would ask the town manager or the public works director if they would like to address this item. Yeah, Mr. Malley, the public works director, is here. He, had, he conducted, along with Steve Harding, an excellent public forum on this issue uh, back about a month or so ago. It was very well attended, and all of the members of the community, uh, Mr. Uh, Berry was there, Chairman Roberts was there, it was very well attended by the public, everyone in the neighborhood. Uh, it, it was nice to have a sewer project that everyone in the community wanted, uh, <laughs> who was present, and uh, it was good to see. And then the bids came in, and they came in uh, lower than the engineer's estimate. So I would encourage you to uh, authorize this work to uh, proceed uh, with. And, and so, the point was made that it would have no effect on the tax rate and it would be not uh, necessary to raise any municipal funds. Yeah, it's all about the sewer fund and we won't need to raise sewer rates to accomplish. So I am looking for a motion. So I move to approve the award of the bid for the Mountain View Park sewer improvements to the low bidder. I second it. Seconded by Council Berry. Any further discussion? Council McGinty. Do we have to? Select the lowest bidder. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure we've never added that low bidder. There have been other reasons that we. It's uh, the reason. Is it? If I might. Yeah, I will defer to the manager to answer that. Yeah, the, the reason this is before you is, is that you haven't actually authorized the project. Usually, the intricacies of who gets awarded the bid is, is deferred to staff. Uh, but the, you know, most most bids we simply award in the past with these sewer projects. They didn't come to the council yeah. because you had approved it as part of the budget right. process. This one, uh, you've never approved. It's ready to go. We'd like to get it going. And uh, the, the only reason I asked, I mean, if we looked at the total bid, is that the figure I should be looking at, the total bid figure, the right-hand right column? There's only 
if in mind it's hard to read one thing but it looks like it's only two two thousand fifteen hundred dollars fifteen fifty three that's right part and one is a local company who has been working in that area on those sewers for years I presume I think it's been years hasn't it? that's true yeah they've done three projects for us down there and they've done a fine job Dearborn's also done they did the Rod Cove reconstruction project but Skip Murray's firm is We've had a long relationship with them, and they've done very good work for us. So I mean, if, I would, if, if there are a significant difference in that, that's why I asked if we had to. I mean, if, if there's a, if if it was twenty thousand dollars, I wouldn't be raising this. But it's fifteen hundred dollars, and you know, I I don't. And I, I would on. ask the manager, please. Yeah, to. Just from a, a factual basis, the, the purchasing policy provides that bid shall be awarded to the low bidder. Uh, how, however, in the case of a tie, that it goes to a local bidder, and, and that's the low bidder is considering all other factors are equal. So, you know, there is some, some leniency, and there is favoritism to a, a local bidder in the case of a tie. I, Councilor Fritz. I guess I'm wondering whether our description of the project adequately, that, that the Dearborn um, company was able to tell the complications of that area. I mean, Murray's would know from having worked on the Montgomery Street, he you would, know, just how familiar. complicated with all the old Right, he's familiar and, with that type of work. It's not your normal sewer project where you're laying new lines, you're uh, replacing old lines, trying to find services from homes. It, it, it's, it takes, you know, it's, it's more time consuming work, I would say, so he's, had more experience doing that, at least in this town. I'm not familiar with what Dearborn has done in other communities, mm -hmm. uh, but he's very familiar with that section yeah. of town and doing this type of work down there. Right, and so I mean, maybe, you know, that added cost would have been taking that into consideration. Council Lynch. Um, I appreciate the concerns of, I guess, doing business locally and, and knowing the contractor, um, but I, I note that the architect did recommend that we award it to the low bidder. Um, that was included in our package. So um, it was on that basis, not just the low bid, but the fact that the architect had recommended that, that I made that motion. Um, Can I ask a question? Councilor Swift-Gatta. So, so are there, in your professional opinion, as public works director, are there differences in quality or experience or any other factors between these two companies that would influence you one way or the other to the to the extent of fifteen hundred dollars. You know what I mean? Oh we try to work around this. <laughs> um, we have a select bid list to start with. We don't just put an ad in the paper. Right. We sort of you know qualify bidders based on our experience with them for previous projects. So we have six or seven people that we send bids to okay. and, and only to them to start with. Okay. So we feel comfortable that if any of them gets the project, they're capable of doing that. Uh, that with that said, you know, Murray again is very familiar with this type of work. If I had a personal preference, I would work with him at any time. He's helped us out in many situations in the past. Glen Avenue, Ottawa Road last year was a prime example of where he basically dropped his entire schedule to come really bail us out of a big problem down there. Right. And, and didn't have to do that. So for that very reason, does he deserve some special consideration? I would say yes. Are there, and this may be more a question for the manager, are there any rules that, I, I know what you just cited as a policy, but is there anything further that would prevent us from making a judgment that his particular expertise mm -hmm. in this type of sewer project, plus our experience with him as a local contractor familiar with our town, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, are there any rules against that would prohibit us from making that decision? Well, I'll have to answer that. All right. Well, I guess the thing I would add in our bidding documents, there's language in there that you know we reserve the right to accept or reject any or all bids. Yeah. You know, there's a paragraph that's sort of a disclaimer, but it does give us the right to award the bid to to anybody really. I mean, we have to have sort of just cause for that, but the language is in the bidding documents, and everybody does know that. And are there just a follow-up question? Are there any risks? to us rejecting the Dearborn. The, the risk is that you might turn off 
the other contractors if they always know that it's going to get awarded to the local fellow. Or, you know, that, that's the risk you take. Yeah. It, does, it doesn't help your competition. However, it's, there's a very small, small difference here. You know, again, if it was twenty thousand dollars, would be a different story. But you want to keep people's interest up because sometimes we might have bigger projects right. where they might not bid on, yeah. right. and uh, so you, you want to keep their interest level up. Mm. You know, for competition's sake. But the margin here is very, very narrow. Very narrow. Councilor Carson. I, I would suggest that we move this question as recommended because this is micromanaging positions that the manager has taken in consultation with the public works director and they obviously have understood all the bids and we're just sort of leaping in here on we haven't got the all the material that they've had and so if this is what they're recommending this is what I should think we would go with all right. if we're going to go with the project. I'm not sure that's what his recommendation says. Oh, well, if it, I don't have it. That, that was the engineer's recommendation. I don't have my glasses on, so I'm not reading that thing. So if it's not, then I'd open it up. But So what is the recommendation of the public works director and of the manager? My recommendation is that you authorize the, the work to proceed, that you leave it at the discretion of the purchasing agent for the award of the bid. Thank you. It works for me. Okay, I will. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand. Contracted I will... to whom that you leave it to the discretion of the purchasing agent uh, to whom the bid is awarded. And I will withdraw my motion. All right. And leave it at the Okay. And second. So, withdraw this. who's the purchasing agent? I'm sorry, I just don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Another hat that okay. a certain person wears. So would it be in order then to move that we approve the sewer improvements and leave to the town manager the decision of who to hire? Which of these two? To accept the bid, whichever bid they okay. take. Okay. The two I'll lowest, to choose between the two lowest bids. I'll, I'll second that. All right. Motion. I'll second that. You get that to your dad? I do. All right. May, may I say one other thing? Councillor McGinty properly noted that there was not a recommendation uh, in the memorandum for me on this issue. and. Yeah. I will take the council's comments under advisement and particularly re relating to the question of what is our risk because I think that that is an important issue not only the risk that Mr. Malley mentioned but also uh, the potential risk if you know a contractor is upset with us and certain actions that of they might dampening, take. The risk of dampening competition and all those things. Yeah. Risk. And I just so, ask in the future if you're recommendation is not that of the town engineer <laughs> that you indicate that because I took as the town's recommendation yeah, I, I that our town engineer See, I, I, I want to be yes. clear Marion I didn't yeah. say that I disagreed with the engineer's recommendation yeah. either all right okay I think we're where we need to be but and I, I guess I'd add just one comment that if the council would like to in the future give some consideration to a local contractor, a local business, or whatever we have, we could sit down at a workshop sometime and specify that if the bid comes within 1% no, or 2%. I'd rather leave it. Yeah, I'd rather leave it. You would give them that latitude. General guidelines. Yeah, I would too. Shoot on a case by case. If we're comfortable. All right, I think we're at the point where we can call the question then. All in favor of uh, the bid being awarded to? Somebody. <laughs> to one of the, the sewer work. As the manager decides. At the discretion yeah, it of just, the just, agent. Just as it's written here. And I believe we have a unanimous on that. Penny, you, did, I didn't see a hand, but were you in favor? Thank you. Yeah. The, we now move to citizens' discussion number two. Item is not on the agenda. And we have one citizen and one potential citizen, I suppose, <laughs> remaining with us this evening. I had one as a citizen. Uh, You're going to have to go down to the podium. Then. No, I think I'll stay here. <laughs> this is the last official meeting of the town clerk as the town clerk of the town of Cape Elizabeth oh. after 17 years and who knows how many meetings and uh, <laughs> how many meetings, some of which ended after 1 o'clock. And, you know, she'll be continuing with us well, in a new capacity, cool. assuming the approval of the budget. And, uh, you know, I know you all join me in praising her for the unbelievable job that she's done administering our election laws, administering our, our liquor laws, administering our council minutes, uh, 
and all of the vital records and, and the things that are specific to the clerk's responsibility of the cemetery. Uh, we've come a long way on a whole lot of those issues and she's faced with many, many difficult challenges and issues and uh, she was the main clerk of the year and uh, numerous other certifications and uh, all extremely well deserved and uh, I've been very pleased to work with her all these years and look forward uh, in the coming years to work with her in her new, new position as assistant town manager. So. Uh, I think the record ought to reflect uh, the praise that we all have uh, sitting here this evening uh, for all that she's done for Cape Elizabeth. So let the, show, let the record show a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> and she put up with me as a neighbor since she was 11 yeah, years old. From the, from the... It's late. Just very quickly, I, I really want to thank Michael for all his confidence that he's had in me over the years to uh, assume the duties of the town clerk and more. Um, I think we've worked well together on that. We've been very fortunate to work with some wonderful counselors um, over the years and department heads. Um, Bob is certainly one of them that um, has been one of my um, mentors over the years and, and the way that he works and conducts business, um, you know, with the citizens and so forth. And I certainly um, look forward to working with the department heads, the residents, um, and the counselors, and, and certainly Michael uh, in these new endeavors. And I, I look for the challenges ahead, uh, hoping I'm going to make a difference uh, in this position as well, because I think um, you know, that I have made a difference you know, in the town clerk's position. I've really, I have done my best. And um, it, it's been great and uh, a lot of hours, but it's certainly been worth it. So I thank you very much. Very good. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Before we go to the... It's going to be tomorrow night sitting there again. Well, we yeah. have ruled the meeting had to end. Before we do go to the next, uh, uh, next item, I do I want to list the meetings that we have coming up so people hear them. Uh, Fort Williams Park Fees Workshop tomorrow night. Public Forum on Budget Issues March 31. Finance Committee Budgets Workshops April 2, 7, 17, 28, and 30th. And the next regular Town Council meeting will be Monday, April 14. And the, the public hearing on the proposed budget is May 12. All, I believe, are at 7.30, and they are on the website if anybody didn't write those all down. Tomorrow so, they'll be on cable TV. And they'll be on cable. All right. And, the, and t tomorrow's meeting, will that be televised? It will be televised. It will be televised. Thank you. E excuse me. And if I could just add, the public forums will be here mm -hmm. in this room? In this chamber, but yes. The, the finance committee budget workshops will be in the room. Back in the William Jordan, the William conference, Jordan room. conference room. Thank you. All right. So it, at this point, I'd, uh, item number 960203, we need to have a, a motion to enter into an executive session I'm to review a request for a hardship abatement of property taxes. I move.